Thank you. Um, welcome to tonight's hearing on proposed short-term rental legislation. Before we begin, I'm going to do the obligatory thank yous for everyone that uh, helped get us to this point. Uh, Ken Paul and Aaron Beck from the mayor, from Mayor Genther's staff. We will hear from Aaron as she provides the overview. I saw that City Auditor Megan Kilgore is with us this, tonight. I do want to thank my staff, Cole Voidach and Kevin McCain, and our intern Patrick Brugelman uh, for his work, CTV, for helping make this arrangements. Our host. Whetstone Rec Center, and I appreciate all of you being here tonight. As you can tell, we've had a lot of interest uh, in what proposal and what would be best for Columbus and our neighborhoods. So we are looking forward to having your feedback. Uh, Tonight's process is really open, uh, as I think everyone's either seen from the table or prior to being here. Uh, there is a proposal that we may, uh, or we're using to provide additional feedback on of what would be the best approach, if any, for short-term rental throughout the city of Columbus. Uh, we're looking to gather additional feedback off of that proposal. Uh, we've had months and months of discussions uh, with some people here, some people out in their community, some at their short-term rental. And really appreciate everyone taking the time to be here, provide additional feedback on the uh, current proposal. I look forward to ongoing healthy debate about this issue. Uh, our goal from the start's never been to ban short-term rental, uh, but similar to what cities across Ohio, the country, the world are dealing with of how do we capture uh, this activity and make sure it's uh, safe and healthy for neighborhoods, but also uh, supporting uh, hosts and the environment that it's created. So tonight, we're not going to be making any decisions. We do have a presentation uh, from uh, Aaron Beck in Mayor Ginther's office. We have a couple speakers that uh, asked ahead of time, and then it's pretty open to any other speakers. Ask that you do fill out a speaker slip. Uh, Kevin McCain is sitting at the table texting uh, either the blue forums or other forums, and all those that uh, finish uh, or fill out a speaker form will be given the opportunity to provide any comments, feedback, uh, criticism, support as they would like. Uh, before I turn it over to Aaron, does Councilmember Remy have any feedback? Appreciate you being here tonight, Councilmember. Thank you very much. It's great to see a nice crowd to uh, hear your testimony in regards to this important issue. And I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. With that, I will turn it over to Policy Advisor to Mayor Genther, Aaron Beck, who will present where we currently are with the proposal. I do apologize that the uh, presentation, we had a little technical difficulty and the projector isn't meeting what I would think are the Columbus Way standards, uh, but there should be copies being floated around or we will make sure a copy is prov provided to anyone that was able to sign in and provide us an email. Aaron, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Councilmember Stenziano, for the opportunity to be here tonight and for your efforts to address short-term rentals in our community. Um, and thank you also for addressing the <laughs> um, technical difficulties we were having with the PowerPoint presentation, so I apologize for that. But like the council member said, I believe everyone who attended tonight signed in at the desk, and so we'll make sure to email you a copy um, of the presentation. Um, like the council member said, my name's Aaron Beck. I'm a policy advisor to Mayor Andrew Ginther. Um, I'm part of our internal affairs team. So I typically work on policies that impact our departments, but of course that means it also impacts the larger community as well. Um, and so just to get started, I really wanted to start with a short overview of why the city of Columbus, um, or really any community, is starting to address the issue of short-term rentals. So first we know that short-term rentals have grown and are growing in popularity. And so by short-term rental, I'm really talking about more of the idea of home sharing and the sharing economy. So it's a dynamic market and the availability of listings um, certainly fluctuates on a daily basis. And so on the presentation, I do have just kind of a bullet point with an article from Business First talking about how Airbnb says Columbus will be one of the hottest growth markets in 2018. And so that was an article just from this past January. And then we also know that there are now um, hundreds of listing sites in addition to just Airbnb. Of course, that one's kind of one of the most well-known. But then we also have HomeAway, VRBO, Couchsurfing, Flipkey, Tripping, and many more. Um, 
Another reason that we know communities and why Columbus is addressing this issue is because there are challenges to our neighborhoods and communities where we see short-term rentals um, kind of popping up and becoming more common. So especially in an urban setting, um, in residential areas, you often have close proximity. And so sometimes that can cause um, more noise or disruption and then just simply having that flow of transient guests coming in and out can cause some unease for some of the other longer term residents. Um, and then it can have impacts on the availability of parking, potentially increased trash, um, just can lead to more strain on public services essentially. Um, that isn't to say that this always happens, but those are issues that can arise and that we start to hear from constituents and community members. And then three, of course, we have um, concerns around safety and sanitation. So a lot of folks might say that short-term rentals utilizing hosting platforms in a lot of ways are they self-regulate in this area um, through the mutual rating system, which is certainly true. However, there of course are always going to be those looking for more budget-friendly listings who might overlook some of those ratings. And then of course all visitors, guests, and residents deserve a minimum standard of guaranteed safety. And we've sort of seen a lot of consensus with that thus far across the board. Most folks really seem to um, be behind that. And so that's, um, of course, we want to address appropriate levels of occupancy, um, that it meets the housing code requirements, that there are sanitary conditions, so you know, no tall grass, rodents, et cetera. These are kind of items that are covered by other sections of code. Um, and then also wanted to take into consideration some of the long-term housing availability and affordability. So that's whether it's home ownership or more traditional long-term rentals. So we've actually seen there's some emerging research and a recent study that finds a 10% increase in Airbnb listings leads to a 0.39% increase in rents and a 0.65% increase in home values. And the study also found that the impact is stronger in neighborhoods with absentee landlords and suggests an incentive to remove properties from the long-term rental market and convert them to short-term rentals, um, therefore causing rents for long-term leases to increase. But again, it does also show that increased listings support a positive for homeowners and owner-occupied properties. Um, so those might seem like somewhat insignificant numbers, but with the growth of short-term rentals, it can have a larger impact. Um, for example, the company Host Compliance, which does specialize in short-term rental monitoring and compliance solutions, estimated an 800% growth in short-term rentals since 2011. So if you kind of extrapolate and do some of that math, that could mean a roughly 30% increase in rental rates. Um, but again, this is pretty preliminary data and research. It's on a national level, so I'm not trying to assert in any way that this is necessarily what's happening here in Columbus. Um, but it is something to keep in mind as we address the issue um, and that as policymakers and elected officials, of course, we certainly have to keep an eye toward the future as we're making um, policy decisions and think about those potential impacts. And then while the previous slide outlined why Columbus and communities across the country are paying attention to this issue, um, I just wanted to ensure that everyone understands our approach thus far and how we've gotten to that point. So Council Member Cinziano already highlighted this somewhat, but really our goal from the beginning was to truly find that Goldilocks zone that balances the well-being and interests of city residents while still allowing short-term rentals to operate and flourish and continue being part of the economic and tourism fabric in our community. Um, and so I know Council Member Stinziano was approached by residents during his community hours and they were concerned about some of the short-term rentals in their community. Uh, and so the mayor's office and Council Member Stinziano's office began researching the issues and approaches to short-term rentals. And then most of last year we spent time holding stakeholder meetings to garner input and really further our understanding as well of the issue in our community, which is really what's led us to today and the draft legislation that we have um, ready and available for public comment. And so I certainly won't go through the legislation word for word, but I know that um, all of you should have received a copy of the briefing document or those were available on the table as well that really outlines um, all of the policy points that I'll be going over here. So just to start with, we, we are going over and referring to chapter 578 
um, which currently refers only to regulations for hotel motels, but we would then be amending it to add in short-term rentals. So we'll start with permitting. So short-term rental hosts will be required to obtain an annual permit from the City of Columbus's licensing section with the Department of Public Safety. Um, and so that does include an application fee of $20 and a permit fee of $75. There will be one permit per short-term rental operation, so that's per the unique address, so it's attached to the address. And then any change in ownership, change in operator, or change in name of the short-term rental host um, would void the current permit and then require submission for a new, new application and permit. Um, you must provide proof of liability insurance for the short-term short rental operation. And I know there are um, some more details on that within the draft language itself. Um, and then a short-term rental host shall be assigned an individual permit number that must be prominently posted with the listing on the hosting platform. And so that just covers sort of those general permit regulations. And then we'll move on to the host regulations. So a short-term rental host must be either an owner or a permanent occupant and primary resident of the property to be used as a short-term rental. A permanent occupant is considered someone who resides at the property more than 51% of the time during a calendar year, and a host must produce at least two pieces of evidence demonstrating the primary residency. And so those documents include motor vehicle registration, driver's license, tax documents, um, a lease copy, or a utility bill. And then a host who's operating in a secondary residence, so where they are not the primary resident and where they're not the occupant, um, may only operate a short-term rental for 104 days in a 12-month period. So if you are the permanent occupant and you live in the dwelling, you can operate um, 365. And then a local 24-hour emergency contact must be designated for the property. And we have more host regulations continued. So um, a host utilizing a platform is responsible not utilize, I'm sorry, excuse me, a host not utilizing a hosting platform like Airbnb or Couchsurfing or VRBO is responsible for maintaining records to demonstrate compliance with this section. And that includes um, primary residency, the name of the short-term rental guest responsible for the reservation um, and who rented, dates and duration of stay in a short-term rental, the rate charged for each rental listing on each night, and then the records must be maintained for four years. And then there, we also have included non-discrimination language so that the host shall not decline a guest um, or impose any different terms or conditions based on race, color, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. Then we'll move into regulations for the platforms. So the legislation does introduce the concept of hosting platforms and then sets forth regulations around them. Um, the hosting platforms can only list short-term rentals that have a valid city permit. So they must display that permit number, account number, with the short-term rental listing or advertisement. And then upon being notified of a short-term rental's invalid or expired permit, the hosting platform must remove the listing within three business days. And then hosting platforms also are required to maintain records for four years, and they must provide, um, upon request, the following information for any listing, um, very similar to the other records that are asked to be maintained. So the physical address, name of person who registered the unit, dates and duration of stay, number of persons scheduled to stay each night, and the room rate charged. And then the hosting platform is also responsible for ensuring that any short-term rental host utilizing their services is provided with information surrounding the regulation and rules of short-term rental operations in the city of Columbus. And then we have the violations and penalties section. So for violations of Chapter 598, specifically that um, pertain to short-term rentals, um, we specifically have if you are, there's a violation for operating without a permit, um, if it's a first offense, it's an unclassified minor misdemeanor, so that's a fine only of up to $250. 
And then if it's a subsequent offense, that does go up to a third degree misdemeanor, um, which could be either or some combination of a fine up to $500 or imprisonment up to 60 days. Um, and then the other violation is a failure to maintain permit on premises. And that is a minor misdemeanor, so that's a fine only of up to $150. And then any revenue obtained from operating a short-term rental without a permit will be remitted to the city of Columbus. And so that kind of covers very high level what's contained within the legis proposed legislation. Um, so what's next is that we're holding these public hearings today to hear from all of you. Um, just like the council member said, I'm excited to see so many people here and hear from all of you, um, kind of your reactions and feedback and input. And then we do plan to add in a delayed implementation period. So you may not see that anywhere on the legislation right now or in the briefing, but that certainly is um, our intent and something that we're thinking about. But we wanted to hear from all of you kind of where we've hit the mark on this and that will really determine you know, our timeline and how we move forward. Um, and then we are also working with the auditor's office on companion legislation for chapter 370, I'm sorry, chapter 371, which regards the tax collection. And that is all I had today, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beck, uh, for that overview, very thorough. We are now also joined by Council President Shan Harden. Council President Harden, do you have any comments? questions at this time? No, thank you, Chair. I just want to say thank you to the, uh, all of you for being here. This is an important conversation. Um, it speaks to our continued growth and our opportunities to bring great people into our community and make sure that uh, we can do so in a way that is good for everyone. And so having your input is, is greatly appreciated. And just thank you again for your leadership. Council Member Remy, you have any questions? I do have a couple of questions, uh, Ms. Beck. So one thing that has been, I think, confusing in the language is how we kind of define owner-occupied, uh, the intent if there was a carriage house or a duplex. Uh, as proposed, and if the language needs to be addressed, uh, could you say what category that falls into, again, carriage houses or duplexes in particular? Sure, so um, like I covered in the overview, the permit is tied to the unique address, so if that's really what it would depend on. Um, but again, like you said, I think if there are definitions that we need to look at again, um, based on the feedback we get from folks here tonight, I think that's something we're open to. Um, but again, if you're the primary resident and you're living at the property, it's that same unique address, um, that would be considered a, a permanent occupant and a resident. Um, and another piece that was always one of the goals was equity, um, trying to make sure there was a level playing here, field. Uh, you didn't really touch upon it, but do you expect the annual inspections for short-term rentals, similar to what hotels and motels uh, have to do, uh, either through this legislation or in the future? So at this point, there's no um, proactive inspection involved with the permitting process. Um, it's really just signing kind of an affidavit and turning in the application, making sure that you meet all of the requirements in order to obtain the permit. Um, so there, at this point, is no proactive inspections involved. It would just be complaint driven. Um, I, that's, that's where we are with it currently. I don't know that I see that changing in the near future at all. So. And then my last question, we got a lot of feedback about the 104-day caps for non-owner occupied. Could you explain where that came from, maybe what some other cities have in that regard, and just the feedback to why that's part of this proposal? Sure. Yeah, so the cap on days really was um, something intended to address a lot of those neighborhood concerns that I alluded to earlier, or really around transient guest noise, kind of disruption, and other potential impacts to that residential and neighborhood character and fiber. Um, I know originally we had really proposed a 90-day cap for any, any and all short-term rentals, but that was changed you know, after we got a lot of feedback from community members and stakeholders on that issue in particular. Um, and so we did change that to 104 days, which really covers most weekends. Um, in fact, I think it covers every weekend of the year, and that only applies now to secondary properties as opposed to all short-term rental properties. So. Thank you for answering my questions. Seeing none other from, oh, Council President Harden does have a question. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And this might be repetitive, uh, because, and, and please excuse my, my tardiness, but uh, a philosophy when, when creating policy, uh, we start with the question, what are we trying to solve for? Um, can you help me phrase that narrative? What, what are we solving for with this legislation, and, and, and um, do we think that we're on the mark with where, where we're at, where we're landed? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, I believe what we're trying to solve is really some of those potentials for the future that I alluded to in the why we're addressing this, especially when it comes to affordable housing and long-term rental availability. Um, just seeing some other communities grappling with a little bit of a loss in some of those long-term rental units um, that are being converted into short-term rentals. So I think that's one of the concerns that we're looking to address. Again, looking toward the future. Um, and again, maintaining some of the neighborhood and residential fabric and feeling of some of our communities. Um, and just making sure as well that our communities are safe and that any visitors that are coming in are safe um, and hosts as well, so. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite Jeff Smith to be our first speaker to offer remarks on behalf of the Short-Term Hosts Alliance. Mr. Smith, the microphone is all yours. Thank you, and thank you for having us here. I'm speaking on behalf of the almost 250 members of the Columbus Hosts Alliance, some of whom you'll hear from tonight. Our mission is to provide visitors with a variety of housing choices and the opportunity to experience diverse Columbus neighborhoods to preserve public safety for residents and visitors, and to promote economic opportunities for local neighborhoods while preserving or improving the overall quality of life for these neighborhoods. We support fair and equitable legislation and very much appreciate having been included in the discussion so far leading up to tonight's hearing. We support a registration system with an equitable and reasonable fee so that hosts can provide emergency contact information and attest that they are providing basic life safety equipment such as smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. We also support the collection of the existing city excise tax and encourage the city to require the various hosting platforms to collect and remit the tax on the behalf of hosts. The removal of the cap on owner-occupied listing is appreciated and an important step forward in treating short-term rentals in a fair and manner. However, the proposed language seems to contradict the verbal assurances we have received that listings on an owner-occupied parcel would be considered owner-occupied. This would include carriage houses, doubles, et cetera, whether or not they have a separate postal address. Our biggest concern is the 104-day cap on the non-owner occupied listings. Any cap on the number of days is arbitrary and is effectively a ban. There is simply no other way to look at it. I can't think of any other type of enterprise where the city dictates how many days a year they're allowed to operate. Operating a whole home listing requires it to be furnished and well-maintained. It takes time to list the property, get bookings, and develop a positive reputation. This is not something that be turned on and off at whim, and it is not viable if the number of days are limited. A cap is an unfair economic burden that does not impact just the host, but also impacts other small businesses that may provide cleaning, landscape, or other types of services. I understand that neighbors have concerns about short-term rentals in their neighborhood. I had the same experience before I was a host. My neighbor across the street let me know he would be doing a short-term rental, and I was not very happy about that. But as it began, I realized that he was there multiple times a week, and the property was well-maintained. I compare that to the long-term rental that is directly next to him across the alley, where there are multiple code violations, the house is in disrepair, and it is rented by people who have frequent parties outside late at night. Police have been there, and I've had to go over in the middle of the night. I definitely prefer the short-term rental across the street than the long-term rental that's not well maintained. There's no doubt there's an occasional issue with short-term rental guests at some properties, but there are already policies and procedures in place to deal with them, just as there are for long-term rentals. Banning no non-owner-occupied short-term rentals is not the solution to the problem. There are others here tonight that will be sharing with you their experience as hosts, the experience their unique listings provide, and the type of guests they serve. Thank you for your time, and the Columbus Host Alliance looks forward to working with the city as leg legislation progresses. Any council members have any questions? Um, council member back, Remy? Maybe back, thank you, Chair Stenziano. Um, I know, Mr. Smith, you mentioned 250 as part of your host alliance. Do we have an idea how many residents, or how many uh, short-term rentals we have in the city of Columbus today? Not, I, 
can't really put an exact number on it. Um, I do know I was looking at some of the websites earlier today. I saw anywhere from 300 on Airbnb that were listed. Um, I think I saw 845 on tripping, but that's kind of a um, consolidation of a bunch of the listing websites. So there's probably overlap on a lot of those. So. And so knowing that there's approximately 383,000 resident or residential dwellings within the city of Columbus, we're talking about less than 0.2% of 1%, I believe, is what the calculation, if not less than that. But I, I just wanted to figure out you know, what we're dealing with and what we're legislating about. And so that was the basis of my question. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Next, I would like to invite the president of the Columbus Realtors Association, Sarah Walsh, to come forward and offer remarks on behalf of her organization. Thank you. Good evening, Council President Pro Tem Stinciano, members of council and guests. My name is Sarah Walsh, and I am the president of Columbus Realtors. Tonight, I'm joined by many of my 7,800 Columbus Realtor members, several of whom are short-term rental hosts but all of who believe in property rights and responsible property ownership. Also, resent, uh, also represented tonight is the Columbus Apartment Association and many of their members. The Columbus Apartment Association represents about 150,000 rental housing units, primarily in large multifamily community. In an effort of not being repetitive, I will be the only one testifying on behalf of the two trade associations who have a keen interest in this legislation. First, we want to make sure that council understands that our organizations believe in responsible property ownership. In 2014, when the city of Columbus was amending code to increase code violations from third degree misdemeanors to first degree misdemeanors, we supported, as well as testified, in favor of those increases demonstrating our support of responsible property ownership. However, as it relates to short-term rental legislation, our members of the Columbus Apartment Association and Columbus Realtors certainly understand concerns surrounding short-term rentals. As a quick point of reference, according to the United States Census Bureau, the City of Columbus has an estimated 383,000 housing units. And as the council member just said, according to conversations with the city, there's an estimated less than 800 short-term rentals in the city, or only two-tenths of 1% of an estimated housing unit uh, in Columbus. While we may disagree with reg regulation overall, we believe it is fair for the city to collect a short-term rental uh, excise tax, which is similar to the bed tax paid by hotels and motels. We are also amenable with the short-term rental registration proposed in the draft ordinance. However, we cannot find any data to show that the number of complaints or code violations relating to short-term rentals or host properties, and we believe that number to be very small. We urge the city to enact a short-term rental excise tax, but please hold off on registration until there is data that indicates more regulation is needed. The last issue related to the legislation that we oppose is the limitation on the number of days for non-owner occupant properties. Currently, you have it proposed as 104 days. Our members are curious, what is the purpose of this limitation? What, what issues are caused by the number of days that we are limiting? Our challenge with limiting the days is that it doesn't seem to address any policy concerns that are proposed. Additionally, it seems like it would be very challenging and costly for the city to oversee and enforce. We are committed to working together on this issue, specifically as it relates to a bed tax and short-term registra registration. Lastly, we'd encourage the city to enforce current code and criminal penalties where applicable on bad hosts and not to punish the vast majority of hosts who are responsible property owners. My colleagues and I sincerely pr appreciate your consideration to make Columbus a safer place. And truly, thank you for your time to allow Columbus Realtors and the Columbus Apartment Association to share our thoughts on this very important city issue. And I thank you. You guys keep applauding. Um, any members have any questions? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Of course. 
Next, I'd like to invite Joe Savarese, Executive Director of the Ohio Hotel and Lodging Association and Greater Columbus Lodging Council to come forward to offer testimony. Thank you, President Pro Tem Stinziano, Council President, members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to add our voice, that of Columbus's hotel and lodging operators, owners, managers, and employees to the important and timely discussion regarding short-term online rentals. And I would like to clarify uh, that the Hotel and Lodging Association and the Greater Columbus Lodging Council represents not only the big branded hotels that uh, you might expect, but also um, many small independent properties and B&B &B proprietors uh, who have been members of our organization for many years as well. So we have an interest in protecting the rights of uh, traditional B&B &B operators as much as those large branded uh, hotels that we operate. It's all part of one industry that's good for the travel economy here in Columbus. Columbus's hotel and lodging infrastructure is a, a critical part of that strong travel economy. Um, there are more than 250 traditional hotel and lodging establishments, and they provide 28,000 rooms to visitors from around the world. And they service the entire population of our region, not just the people that come in from out of town. We are still a growing hotel market with numerous additional properties and projects in the pipeline. And for folks who have the misconception that one of the things that the hotels are worried about is that Airbnb and other platforms are stealing business, I can tell you in terms of this community, we don't have enough hotel rooms for the large national events that we are bringing to this community. Our industry believes that when it comes to providing great experiences for visitors, more choices are a good thing, but they need to be good choices. This principle is what guides us in advocating for reasonable oversight of short-term rental businesses. And the goals that we've uh, uh, talked about are very simple. Guest health and safety have to come first, and you've addressed those this evening. A level playing field in terms of oversight, regulation, and taxation is necessary and smart. And steps should be taken to ensure that there's no negative impact on neighbors and neighborhoods. And the draft legislation does take good steps in this direction, although like many of the parties here, we uh, certainly will have uh, input about ways that we can strengthen the draft uh, going forward. Columbus is fortunate to have a growing number of short-term rental hosts who operate their businesses responsibly. Recognize the value of that reasonable oversight, which you heard and are going to hear tonight, and want to participate in efforts to support and grow our travel economy. These individuals are an important additive part of all that we have to offer as a thriving destination. But at the same time, as an industry representative, I have to say that it's important to recognize the aspects of the short-term rental market which, if left unregulated, can produce unintended and damaging impacts. And while many of these things are not happening here yet, fortunately, in our community, if you look at the evidence uh, in other large metropolitan areas around the country, I think we can see some of those things that we want to stay ahead of the curve on and avoid those problems taking root in our community. Uh, as has been alluded, the data shows that a growing portion of the business for some of the largest platforms is made up of full-time, non-owner-occupied commercial operators. And this type of rental has been shown to have certain effects that have been alluded to, uh, change the fabric of neighborhoods, limit affordable housing options, uh, and increasing demand on public services, all of which were talked about earlier. But in the worst case scenarios, and we're not seeing this yet in Columbus, thankfully, and we want to avoid this from happening, some operators will attempt to avoid scrutiny and regulation by operating what really amounts to illegal hotels by listing multiple rooms in a particular building and advertising each individually as short-term rental units. This way they can avoid critical fire, safety, health, accessibility, and other regulations that hotels have to follow. And this is neither good for visitors to our community nor Columbus's reputation as a destination of choice. This legislation does contain important tools to effectively prohibit and prevent the growth of illegal hotels. And this is one of the most important aspects of oversight for us. We want to stay ahead of that curve so that problem doesn't take hold in our community and the strong, thriving, short-term online rental market that we have can be an additive part to our travel economy. The legislation extends some simple oversight provisions to short-term rentals that already govern other lodging businesses. Um, including registration, liability protections, the reporting of data to the city, um, the ability for the city to inspect when necessary, 
provisions to combat uh, human trafficking, drugs, and other illegal activity, all things that professional lodging operators have had to comply with for many years. In moving the legislation forward, we must also ensure that it holds the rental platforms accountable for being a responsible partner, partner and meeting obligations to the community while contributing to the local economy as well. Uh, and I uh, second the notion that was put forth before that we do need to take a look at uh, the collection of taxes and the difference between the onus being placed on the short-term rental host and being placed on the platform where it belongs. This includes fair application of taxes paid by other lodging providers uh, to these online platforms and ensuring that the platforms don't facilitate illegal rentals. We must ensure that as the process moves forwards, we carefully weigh the need to address neighbor and neighborhood protections and the need to prevent illegal hotels with the desire not to unintentionally impact traditional lodging businesses and responsible operators. Uh, and I do submit that this is particularly true regarding the uh, way that the language is drafted regarding the number of days that short-term rentals are uh, permitted, but I think that together we can work on what is that problem that we are trying to preempt maybe not even solve, but to stay ahead of and make sure that the language accomplishes that. The City Council and Columbus have taken big steps forward with the introduction of this legislation. We remain supportive of your efforts as we have been throughout. We do appreciate the collaborative approach, which has made Columbus famous and the thriving destination that it is. And we, continue to, we will continue to work in that collaborative and productive manner to help complete the process. We look forward to working with you. We really do believe that we can create a model which benefits visitors, which benefits the operators of short-term rentals, and benefits the entire community, and can be a model that other communities around the state and the country uh, will look to if we keep moving in the direction that we're headed. Thank you. See how long your applause is, Joe. Um, council members, have any questions? Council President Harden. Mr. Severs, thank you for uh, coming out this evening. I, I too, would have issue with um, uh, the growth of an illegal hotel uh, industry in the city of Columbus. <clears throat> and again, going back to that philosophical question, what are we trying to solve, or even uh, in this case, what are we trying to prevent? Uh, do you have an opinion uh, verse on cap of uh, days versus cap on properties that would go towards that issue, because if we're trying to um, limit uh, several units being uh, uh, rented out in, in one place, is there is the cap on days the way to do it? Uh, well, as your uh, colleagues sitting next to you will testify, I have plenty of opinions uh, about all this. But, uh, but the answer is yes, I think that we can help address that problem by looking at different ways to go about achieving the same result. Caps on days are, are one way to do that. But our experience, what we bring to the table, and I, and I hope everybody will use this as a resource, is having worked on this, not just here in this community, but in other communities in Ohio and around the country through our national network and all of our affiliates, our counterparts in the other states. And while caps on number of days can be applied in a way that don't negatively in fact, uh, impact responsible operators, there is a way to come up with some additional language to make sure they apply to preempting those problems that we're talking about. So it's, I, I hope that the discussion doesn't have to be cap or no cap, but maybe we need to take a look at how that's applied and what type of enterprise it affects to make sure we're having the intended result, if you follow me. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Seeing no other questions, thank you for providing testimony. We will now open it up to uh, residents who filled out speaker slips. We have 24, so we're going to ask that everyone respects each other's time. I'm going to call up oh, the first one, which is Kathy Gerber. Next is Scott Gerber. And then when Scott comes up, I will introduce the one to follow you, Scott, and then we'll just get the line going that way so people don't have to stand too long, but at least are prepared and ready. Ms. Gerber. The podium microphone is all yours. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, my husband, Scott, here, we put together a few posters. It's going to be hard for everybody to see the poster, so I'll, I'll talk through it as well. But uh, good evening, uh, Councilman Hardin, Stinciano, and Remy, and for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name, as uh, Michael said, it's Kathy Gerber, my husband, Scott Gerber, here. 
Um, we've been discussing this issue with the city probably over the last two years. Uh, this started when a couple purchased a house next to us, and it was exclusively as an investment property. They came out and they specifically said that. They turned it into a full-time, non-owner occupied uh, investment that they would rent out through the Airbnb platform. Um, as you know, Airbnb started out as a concept of running out a room, sharing a house, but it's exploded and we're seeing investors see it as a way to make money. And it's starting to create problems that are in our neighborhood as we've seen over the last two years. And the numbers of these issues are growing. I'd like to share with you um, a couple of numbers here. And these numbers, uh, for those of you who are familiar, are from AirDNA, which uh, takes some of the Airbnb data and um, summarizes those for people. So if we take a, take a look here, we have 45% uh, of the Airbnb hosts in Columbus have multiple rental listings. How can they have multiple rental listings? They have multiple properties. And this is up from originally 19% a year and a half ago. Another statistic is 35% of Airbnb rental listings in Columbus are full-time short-term rentals. Again, that's now, and it was, again, 19% a year and a half ago. Um, when we take a look at the impact to the neighborhood, over the last two years, we've seen over 400 strangers were brought into our neighborhood over that period of time. Uh, people, uh, we live in a neighborhood, it's the northwest side of Columbus near Riverside Hospital to give you a perspective. Uh, people we've seen coming and going at all hours, you know, making noise, parking illegally, honking horns to notify their friends they're coming, that they're going, um, clicking their key fobs at all hours of the day and night. And our property, again, you can't see this, but our property, uh, their parking lot, their driveway is nine feet from our bedroom window. So we're hearing this stuff all the time. Um, again, we, we have commercial trucks for people who come in and rent the property. We have bachelorette and bachelor parties. Uh, over our 4th of July, we had 80 people coming and going for a party in, in the backyard, drinking, you know, normal party stuff. Um, one evening, we had um, some gentlemen that rented the, the house next door. They came in with different boxes, and they were making something. You know, we could see kind of the, the window into the kitchen. They weren't making food. What were they making? We can only surmise. You know, we can't. We can't really guess, but it wasn't food, so what was going on? Um, the property next to us says they don't allow smoking. Well, but there's cigarettes on the street. They, they stand in, their, in the driveway right next to our bedroom, um, smoking at all hours. Um, you know, 7.30 in the morning, a woman's outside having an argument with somebody on her cell phone because she didn't want to be in the house with her friends interrupting their, their day but they were you know, right next to us interrupting ours. These are the sorts of things that you know, aren't illegal by any means, right? But they're a disturbance to the neighborhood. Um, again, we talk about the smoking, they have a large expandable RV that's parked out uh, at the property. So those are the sorts of things that we're, we're seeing in the community in a neighborhood. And certainly there's far worse. I mean, anybody going out and looking at the stuff on Airbnb, some of the, the terrible things that are going on, um, large parties and so forth, which I, I won't get into. I know you can go out and find all that stuff yourselves. We're, we're glad to see the draft legislation is, has been put together. What we really want to focus on is what is the core model that we're using for these short-term rentals. Um, Councilman Stinziano indicated that the legislation originally would be modeled after other cities. And uh, during the original discussions with the city, we were looking at short-term rentals that were only taking place in permanent residences versus properties that were purchased exclusively for rental on a short-term basis. Um, so the, the draft legislation is a little different than what we expected, uh, specifically um, regarding um, allowing people to rent out investment properties on a full-time basis for short-term rentals. Uh, what I put together here is um, uh, basically a short-term rental model summary. 
Um, so the top columns talk about permanent residents who are owners or renters that have the approval of uh, their landlords. And they are either hosted rentals, hosted meaning the owners are there during the rental process. There's also the same category of a permanent resident who's not there during the hosted rental. And then there is the third column, which is a non-permanent resident, which is basically an investment property or a second home. And again, what's going on? If you take a look at uh, some of the cities that I took a look at, and you can go ahead and, and look at, as I did, a number of ordinances and articles re related to these cities. But in San Francisco, as you know, where Airbnb started, right now, they're unlimited as far as the number of um, rentals that they can have um, during a year as long as the host is present. If the host is not present, they are limiting those rentals to 90 days a year. Um, and specifically, if the house is not uh, owned by the permanent resident, that short-term rental is not allowed. And that's the same setup that New York State has. Okay, so these big cities have been through it, and they've been through it, and they've revised their, um, their ordinances and how they deal with it over time. We're just getting started, right? Um, same thing kind of with Cleveland and uh, Chicago. Both Cleveland and Chicago and Fairfax County, Virginia, is also about soon to implement their legislation. And what they say, again, is a permanent resident can rent out a short-term rental, hosted or unhosted, for a maximum of 90 days a year. But again, they do not rent out a permanent residence that is not occupied, okay? Uh, if you take a look down here, I'll, I'll get back to Columbus here in a minute, but Madison, Wisconsin, again, a big college town, they, their implementation on legislation is they actually have a maximum of 30 days a year for hosted and unhosted uh, permanent resident housing. Again, not, not allowed for uh, non-permanent residents. Uh, there's also places, um, they're smaller in, in, uh, in size, like Broadview Heights, Ohio, and Worthington, Ohio up the street that don't allow any short-term rentals. Now, that's not to say that it's not happening, because it is, but from a legislation and ordinance standpoint, it's not allowed. Um, taking a look at this, we're new to this, so why don't we take a look at this and be conservative? I know there was a statement about um, evolving and, and taking it in steps. So one of the things that we were looking for is, okay, uh, we're, not, we're not like Chicago. Um, you know, we're not New York, we're not San Francisco. Let's uh, go in and start with a 60-day approach as far as short-term rentals. And I know that concerns people, but I can tell you cities such as Cleveland, New Orleans, and Nashville are dealing with enforcement issues and problems with non-owner-occupied investments with short-term rentals. If we don't do it right, if we don't phase this in, we're going to have issues. Again, looking at the number of uh, short-term rentals that are owned by, you know, have multiple listings by multiple operators, there's going to be issues. I mean, this is a business. So it's not our traditional, you know, family who wants to make a couple extra dollars, you know, to help put Junior through college. So I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak, and um, I look forward to the um, eventual um, finalization of the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Ger Mrs. Gerber. Are any questions or comments from my colleagues? If we could tone down the applause since we've done three. I think we all get there's passion on both sides of the issue, but it's going to take up more time. We have 26 speakers we'd like to get through. Mr. Gerber, I don't know if you have anything additional you want to add, and after that will be Steve Gladman. Okay, that's fair. Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Gerber, and um, as, as Kathy mentioned, we live right beside a permanent Airbnb motel. How many have, have you been? How many have stayed in a motel before? Okay, certainly a lot. I, I always look for couples to both kind of raise their hands at the same time, and that's pretty good tonight. Oh, let me do one other thing first. Is there a time limit? Yeah, there is. Thanks. 
that's the distance our bedroom window is from this motel. Nine feet, that's all. So what happens when people come in? You, we've, as Kathy didn't mention this, but you can see, okay, sometimes you'll have about six, seven cars in the driveway. What do they all do? They slam their doors when they come, and what else do they do? I need a beeper for my fob. Larry, can you help me out? What happens after that? Slam the door. Slam the door and a beep, right? Over and over again. And what's, what happens then? You never know if you've just heard the last beep of the night, the last car slam of the night. You just don't know. So just as in any motel, you, you sometimes know, you know, you, you're not going to get a good night's rest. And that's the way it is when you live beside a permanent Airbnb motel. You just don't know. Sometimes you sleep well, sometimes you don't know. You just don't know. Just, just a second. We're not taking questions. Okay. And Mr. Gerber, if you could actually focus on the legislation presented to us, that would be appreciated for the hearing. Okay, okay. So, permanent Airbnb motel, unacceptable should not happen, is not happening in the other cities, should not happen for Columbus either. Okay, we're very fortunate that we don't have any young children here anymore in, in our house. But what should happen is, and, and I know uh, Mrs. W Ms. Walsh is here from the real estate agency, or real estate uh, folks, is we should never sell our house to a young family with young children. Should not happen, is not acceptable. Really, what we need to have is in the MLS listing, there needs to be a warning that there's a permanent Airbnb motel next to you. Because it is not acceptable to have, again, we have, uh, you're finally getting your one or two year old to bed, and all of a sudden, there's another fob beat, or there's another uh, car door slam. It's not, in a, it's not a good environment for kids. So I urge you to take a look at all this. I mean, you also have some of the, uh, I'm not going to say who's, the, who's part of the creepy people of America, but right now, you know, we live 0.13 miles from St. Tim's. There's kids walking by our house constantly, either to St. Tim's or to the buses down the street. And you could just have, again, the creepy people are normally in those nondescript white panel vans. Well, they don't have to be now. They can just be sitting right in the middle of our neighborhood watching all these kids go by. So again, not acceptable to have permanent motels in a residential neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerber. Any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, it's Mr. Gladman and then Jack Dunkel. President Harding, Pro Tim Cinciano, Councilman Remy, thank you. Uh, my comments really just focus on regulation in general, so these are the Steve principles of regulation, if you will. I, generally, I think less is the best, that we should not over-regulate any industry. We tend to figure out what the worst possible circumstance is and jump immediately there, and I think that's a approach that, that needs some moderation. There needs to be clear, uh, a clear need, a clear public policy outcome that's supported by local empirical data and not just anecdotal information. Uh, it also should be uh, structured in a way that it's not, does not disadvantage any market segment. So if you think about the short-term rental uh, market, there are three components. There's hotel motel, there's owner-occupied, and there's non-owner-occupied. So you would hope that there would be equity with, with those people who are comp competing within that same market. Uh, the proposed ordinance really has three major components. It has a short-term rental excise tax, which is very similar to the, the transient guest tax that hotels pay. There's a registration component, and then there's a limitation for one segment of the market on the number of days that can be occupied. I think the short-term excise tax is fair since ex excise tax is similar to the transient guest bed tax paid by hotels and motels, so everyone be paying a very similar tax. 
The proposed ordinance allocates the short-term rental excise tax to the general fund. I would recommend that you create a new fund, a housing stabilization fund, and that money would go to assist families in need that are facing default on their rental agreement so they can stay in their houses. As we, as we all know, um, the eviction issue is real in our community and around our country. We struggle for solutions. This would be, in essence, a new source of funds, a source of funds that could be uh, dedicated in maybe innovative ways to address that. The registration seems to be uh, unnecessary, at least premature. Uh, there's a tax requirement, so you'd be capturing that information about who's paying those tax, so you would have some knowledge of that. Um, again, uh, the proposed registration fees have disparity in the market because hotel motels would be paying one tax for, a, for their hotel or motel. The way the legislation is written, it's a unique address approach. So if I had 10 units I was using, or five or four or whatever, I would pay multiple fees for that. So I would pay for each unique address, whereas another segment of the market would only pay a single fee. Um, the 104-day limitation also creates a, a disadvantage for one of, that, one of those people in the market segment, which would be the non-owner occupied. So you're advantaging one segment of the market over another, which I think is a question whether you want to create a market uh, inequality through, through ordinance. And then the last thing I want to bring up, and I'm not an attorney, but in the discrimination prevented section, which is 598.10, uh, um, it's written, and it's, I believe it's contrary to federal law and state and the city code 2331. The language prohibits discrimination against uh, marital status, which is not a protected class, but it does not talk about familial status, which is a protected class. Reading this, theoretically, you could discriminate against families with children, not allowing to, to, to use the short-term rental. It's also it would be a violation of both local code and the federal code, and I point out this is the 50th year of the Civil Rights Act, so perhaps at least that segment uh, needs to be looked at by the city attorney and others, because I think it's just in incorrectly written. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? Thank you, Mr. Gladman. Next up is Jack Dunkel. Following Jack, we have August Brunsman IV. Yep. What I'd like to know is how did the zoning get changed? And I, I didn't hear too much about the zoning when the young lady was talking about that. We were told at the first meeting by somebody from City Hall that we lived in a residential area. Our whole area is a residential area. We have no commercial property. But if you buy a house and rent it out, as many days as you want, and you don't live there, we're not talking about a, a college kid living in the, in the basement or something like that for a quarter. We're talking about somebody being there the majority of time, but no owner. How is that not a commercial property? And how do you determine, do you, know, you close your eyes and point and say that house can be a commercial property? If I wanted to build boats out of my garage and sell them online, I couldn't because I'm conducting a business. And it's no different than this. If you want people to come to Columbus and you want places for them to stay, build more hotels on Old and Tangy. But leave our houses alone. Uh, how, how do you change that from, from residential to commercial? Is that something that uh, is even addressed? How do you do that? because we can't do it. So that's all I wanted to address. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, Mr. Brunsman, and after Mark Dempsey. Well, thank you so much to everyone who's here and the council and uh, Ms. Beck for all of your excellent work. I really um, like a lot of the proposal. Uh, I will uh, sort of echo a couple things have already been said. Uh, one is uh, I love the idea of uh, centralized tax collection. I think that's great. And I really like the idea of maybe taking that money and putting it into something to help uh, families that are having trouble. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, but the other thing is um, uh, uh, 
council uh, president, I believe, uh, Hardin, you'd asked about uh, days versus, say, number of units. Um, I think uh, we should explore very carefully uh, looking at perhaps maybe, um, well, I believe the current legislation uh, defines a hotel as five or more rooms. Perhaps if we look at uh, four or fewer units per perhaps a resident of Columbus, that might be a way to uh, you know, allow some uh, investment activity to allow that sort of segment to exist uh, without it you know, taking over the city uh, with short-term rentals. So that's all I have. Any questions? Any questions, comments? Thank you, August. Thank you. Mr. Dempsey, following Mr. Dempsey, we'll have Kathleen Vick. Uh, first, I want to say, Ms. Beck, you do a great job representing Mayor Ginther in this uh, opportunity, and the council member Hardin and Stinziano and Ramey. Thank you for having me here today. I am a businessman downtown that is interested in going into a, an Airbnb project. At the 104-day limit, I will be out of business in 104 days. So it doesn't work. <laughs> I do like the fact that you're proposing the, the uh, legislation for the folks like the Gerbers because it sounds like a nightmare and you do need a registry, you do need some type of ramifications for folks like that, that you don't have now. But putting a limit to any business operation in America is just un-American. So I'd appreciate it if that you would reconsider the limitation and just take it out and maybe just move on with the legislation without the limitation and revisit it in six months. That's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dempsey. Next, we have Kathleen. After that, Todd Langley. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Kathleen Vick, and I was an architect in New York City during the 80s. I had a condominium there that was a $3 million property. I rented it because I didn't have the money to buy it. It was on Duane Street, and when I transferred to the Limited, in 1991, I had an opportunity to purchase a home for the first time in my life. I was 37 years old, and I bought a property, or the bank let me live there for 18 years, I should say, at 1064 Brentford Drive, 43220 is my zip code. I lived near the Gerbers, and I lived near Mr. Dunkel, and I have to say, it was the most exciting thing for me to know that I lived in a private, single family home ownership neighborhood with other people that owned homes that took care of their property, took care of gardens. I had a garage door opener for the first time in my life. And over the 21 years that I've lived on Brentford Drive, I now own the home myself. <laughs> and I've married since, my husband and I live there together, we've seen our neighborhood very, I would say rapidly transforming into rental properties. Now, a lot of the people that live in our neighborhood are elderly people, and I'm over 65 now, but people sell their homes, they sell their homes through realtors, who I believe are unscrupulously not advertising the homes to people who would want to be interested to live there as single family residents. But in a situation, for instance, and you can look it up online, 1080, a next door, right next door to me, the couple went into a nursing home, they gave the property to their son to sell, who auctioned the property peculiarly, and it was sold for a very low price. The person who bought the home then sold it through a realtor who formed an LLC, and the realtors became owners, and it immediately became a rental property. I said to the person who drove up in a big fancy black car, and I said, are you my new neighbor? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I work for X real estate company, and I'm going to be forming an LLC with a partner of mine at this real estate, this realtor, and I are going to form an LLC, and we're going to use this as a kind of a nest egg. We like this. We're going to get a family in here. And I said, well, what about a family that might want to buy it and live here. 
isn't that what you're supposed to be doing as a realtor? Aren't you supposed to be advertising that home for people that want to live there? And then I was somehow convincing myself that society has changed so much that there aren't husband and wife and children, there are not people in our community that are looking for a $200,000 house two miles from OSU. The, the actual, actually what it is, is I think that the real estate companies, or these realtors, I should say, are the ones who are, it's almost like insider trading. They know about the property, they're listing the property, but then they're going ahead and they're selling it to people that are, like Kathy Gerber said, they're people that are predominantly interested in owning the home as a commercial venture. That's what I'm really opposed to. And the point that Mr. Dunkel made about the zoning in our area, if somebody really is buying a, a private home and they are using it as a commercial venture, I think that should be a zoning violation. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? Thank you, Ms. Vick. Next, we have Todd Langley, followed by Andrew Gritzman. Good evening, council members. I'm also a member of the Columbus Toast Alliance and uh, enjoy that platform a very lot. Got a lot of information that over the last several months as far as our uh, regulations and what we're proposing to the council. Um, I host in a Marion Village. I originally started out with the home that I lived in and then I moved in with my partner but wanted to keep the home. I didn't know what to do and then I was introduced to Airbnb at that particular point. I wanted to keep the home just in case my original arrangements didn't work out. <laughs> So I made the improvements to the home, I got on Airbnb, and I went from there. Shortly two years later, there was another home down the street that was in very much disrepair, disrepair abandoned, and so I used, bought that home as well and also introduced that as an Airbnb. I'm a responsible homeowner. I'm a responsible host on Airbnb. I met my properties every single day. I meet my guests. I love what I'm doing. My houses still need repair, so I'm using part of this money, I have a full-time job as well, but I'm using part of this money to go ahead and invest in those properties to be able to buy low and sell high eventually, which is what we all want to do from an investment standpoint for our years down the road. Um, I love what I do. I cannot operate, though, on 104 days. Like the gentleman said earlier, I'll be out of business 104 days. Over the four years that I've been doing this, I've had over 400 guests come through my homes between two properties, and I've had zero problems. All of my neighbors know exactly what I'm doing. I have them partner with me as far as letting me know what's going on. I do not host parties. I have very strict regulations of what goes on in that house. I have two houses that are within three doors of each other, which is a very unique opportunity, so I do a lot of wedding events. I have a lot of churches in the area. I have people that come in with families. I have a lot of families on my street that actually use my properties because they host Thanksgiving dinners. They host, uh, I had a lady that just had a, a granddaughter and she stayed across the street of the house because the parents did not have room to host her as well too. So I've had a lot of weddings as well too just in the neighborhood when people come in with families, they live on the same street that I had the houses on. So I've got family members that come in. I also have a, um, a, 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 a dad who's divorced he, um, he's a guest that comes in. He lives in Washington, D.C. He's divorced and has two daughters that live here in Columbus. He comes in here every two weeks and enjoys spending time in my home because it's like his home. His daughters have their own rooms and everything, and he can operate out of that and not being able to live in a hotel and give his daughters that kind of convenience as far as that family split up anyway. So there's all the social aspects of hosting that really make this a valid venture, but I cannot support 104 days. I can't operate that. I will be out of business very quickly. I can't afford to pay the mortgage, the bills. I also pay cleaning people. I pay um, support people as well. And I've got the full support of my community. So I like to just get that rid of that 104 days and let us be open to that, have a review later on for whatever we want to do. But um, restricting us like this right now is just not good business. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, thank you, Todd.
Next, we have Andrew, followed by Matthew Scherhoff. Please reduce the applause. Thank you. We'll be here. <laughs> my name is Andy Gottesman. I've been a resident of Columbus for 28 years, and this is my first meeting like this, so I'm glad I was able to be here and participate and appreciate it. <laughs> so I'm that bad person that bought the property across the street from where I live in Victorian Village area and turned it into a commercial investment property. Uh, I run it as a full-time, non-owner-occupied Airbnb, and I absolutely love it. It may seem like it's, oh, you put it on Airbnb and the rest of it takes care of itself, but it is literally a full-time job. Every single day, the first thing I'm doing is checking the app. The last thing I do before I go to sleep is checking the app and every single day doing a mental checklist to ensure that I have all of the essential necessities to make sure that the guests are gonna get an experience in Columbus, Ohio that they can't get anywhere else. I've taken the time to accumulate things like dining menus from all the restaurants, restaurants in the short north area, and I have three quick stories to share with you. My first guest that I absolutely loved, it was a group of five Columbus City school teachers that wanted to get together a couple weeks ago and watch the royal wedding together so they could be away from their families. <laughs> They left me a raving review. They had the best time. They had mimosas in the morning and just had such a unique experience that wouldn't be possible anywhere else. It wouldn't be possible if I was coming down in the morning and saying, good morning, ladies. The next group that I had was a family that came in from China for six days to celebrate their daughter's graduation from Ohio State. It was a multi-generational family that was able to stay in my three-bedroom home and really just enjoy the time together and experience what it's like to be in Columbus. They were cooking meals, and since I live across the street, I'm able to see them come and go as they are, and I'm also make sure that I'm available if any issues arise. Um, the 104-day cap isn't gonna work for as a non-occupied host, and I hope that we work forward to a good solution. Thank you. Questions or comments from my colleagues? Thank you, Andrew. Matthew, followed by Sharon Seitler, apologize. Hey, Council. Uh, my name is Matthew Stierhoff. Um, I'm a property manager in my parents' uh, house on campus here. Um, and I just want to voice my uh, opposition for the 104-day cap. Um, essentially, um, we're fine with everything else that, that everyone has proposed, and we think everything is great. Um, I guess the only, the only issue there um, that I'll say is we're fine with a complaint-driven system. You know, I, I feel for the Gerbers. Um, but that's, you can't group everyone in, into that, that group. You know, we've done it for a year. I've had no issues with neighbors. I mean, car doors slamming and, and cars honking, that happens, you know, everywhere in any neighborhood ever, whether it's short term, long term. I mean, you, you can't just say that that's a, an, uh, you know, issue because of this, people coming and going type thing. I mean, I know there might be a little bit more activity and stuff like that, but um, you're going to get that you know, no matter what happens. So, you know, I feel for them though if it is complaint driven, you know, they might be out of, you know, there might be, need to be something that's to in investigate these claims and not just, you know, a, a couple car horns or something like that. Um, I'll just say that, you know, with, and as I mentioned earlier, long term versus short term, I'm in our place usually twice a week to clean it. So it's always up kept and nice. You know, we, we redid the whole place before we rented it out, fresh paint, you know, everything's redone. I go there once a week and mow the grass. Um, you know, we're always on top of things. I know there might be some, some hosts that, that aren't like we are, but I don't think it's fair to punish, you know, a good host like us uh, that are there. And, you know, we only have one unit. You know, I don't know if you want to look into something that's with multiple units like we talked about. We're fine with that. But we're just, you know, one, one family trying to, you know, rent our college house out. I mean, it's nicer than it was when, when I went to college at Ohio State and we live there. Um, so I'm kind of jealous of the people that get to stay there now. Um, so that's just you know my opinion and thoughts on on the cap. So thank you. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none. Sharon, followed by Gary Stolfoth. Hello, I'm Sharon Sider, and um, really appreciate the opportunity, council members, to be here and talk a little bit about my experience as an Airbnb host. Um, one thing I wanted to um, just bring to your attention, though, is the question about whether there are different addresses yet on the same parcel, which is the case with my duplex. Um, I really think that should be considered an owner-occupied property. We're there all the time. And um, you might want to look into that since most of the older duplexes in Columbus are two separate addresses. Um, also would like to point out that our owner-occupied duplex, um, it's two bedrooms on each side. We rent out the whole house. 
And I actually have three boys under the age of four. The youngest was born the day before Thanksgiving in our house, and he has never once been woken up by any noise from next door. Um, so as far as thinking about just the level of noise that some residents have experienced, that's not been my experience. It's been an awesome experience for our family in every way. Very respectful guests 99% of the time. And honestly, I think it's on the host to um, make sure that happens by responsibly listing the property on Airbnb in terms of not asking that guests not hold parties, things like that. There are things that you can take, common sense precautions, to ensure that your house is not a party house, so to speak. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the behavior that's so disruptive to these neighborhoods is definitely not what I want as a host. Noisy guests are not taking care of my home. I don't want that happening. They're going to be leaving a mess and just disrespectful of everything. Um, so overall, Airbnb, I believe, is a really good thing for our city. It provides such a unique place for residents, or rather for guests to stay when they visit the city. Um, I would know I stay in hotels like four and five times a month. So it's just, it's very different to have a real bed, to have a kitchen there, um, home furnishings. All of that just really offers something special to people who are coming to visit our city and see it for the first time. I'd also like to point out that when you stay in a larger hotel, um, name brand chain, that's going to some large corporation. And also the places where those hotels are located are closer to big box stores and national chains in terms of dining options. When people come to my home, it's almost like I'm a local tour guide. I'm sending them down the street to the restaurant that my friend owns and the places that my neighbors work at. And just there is this element of the money staying in our community, both in my pocket and for the clothes on my kids' backs, um, but also for the people who own and operate local businesses. So I think it's important to think about that and to see that Airbnb is very much a win-win for people visiting our city and for the homeowners and the people who own property here. Um, I'd also like to just, again, emphasize that the 104-day cap is not really a cap. It is a ban. You can't operate on that. Um, I would lose money relative to just renting my property out. All of the things that I do for my residents, I have to pay the utilities, I have to pay for supplies. I clean the property myself, but my time's invested there. If I were to pay a cleaner, that would be hundreds of additional dollars each month. Um, so it is just not sustainable to operate that way. Um, these are not, in most cases, large, wealthy people who own hundreds of units or anything like that. Most people own one or two properties that they're listing on Airbnb. Um, in my case, it's really it's just my family. This is helping us to afford our mortgage to be homeowners, um, whereas that would be much more difficult for us otherwise. Um, it's small business. It's not big business that would be affected by this cap, which is really a ban. It's um, small businesses, and it's the people in your community. Um, so I urge you to just consider that, um, look into the address issue, and. Um, just consider the impact both on families in the community, but also businesses everywhere. Thank you. Sharon? Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, we'll have Gary come up, followed by Jacob Sternberg. My name is Gary Stulfoth, and I'd like to talk about short-term rentals located in residential neighborhoods that are used primarily as party venues. And I know about this because I live right across the street from a large house that is not occupied by its owners. And most weekends go something like this. The first, oh, okay. The first guests uh, arrive around noon on Friday. It's usually one or two people. They bring decorations and sometimes lighting and folding tables and coolers. They are the setup crew. Um, later in the evening, more people arrive until at the end of the day there are eight, usually about eight to twelve people staying in a house with only two beds. And most of these people arrive in their own cars, so on a street where many of the residents use on-street parking, the guest cars begin to dominate the available parking. And this goes on until noontime on Sunday. On Saturday, when it's time for the main party, even more people come. So there are even more cars. And most of these people, they're not coming from outside Columbus or even outside the Columbus area. They're not, certainly not coming from out of state. Most of them are local people that are looking for a large space to have their party. Over the last two years, we've had loud music and loud noise, crowd noise during the day and late into the evening. 
We've had light shows. We've had a male stripper. We've had donkey rides for adults. We've had ducks. I don't know who for. You know, and there are the um, loud, middle of the night mass comings and goings. Uh, the point being that at, at this particular rental, lodging is incidental, and judging from the number of beds, it's totally inadequate. And the primary reason people rent this house is as a party venue. So I would suggest that the regulations include a provision that uh, if you have a short-term rental and it's located in an area zone for residential use, and the city receives evidence demonstrating that it is used primarily as a party venue that the city begins steps to revoke that permit subject to you know whatever the due process provisions are in regulation. Um, Short-term rentals located in residential areas that are used primarily as party venues are a stain on the whole short-term rental business. And I think it would behoove the city to take steps right away to clean up that stain so that in three or four years it gets even more set in, you know, you don't have to like go to the cleaners to try to get rid of this. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, Jacob Sternberg, followed by, and unfortunately can't read the handwriting, MJ Ashley. And anyone keeping track at home, we have about 17 more speakers to go. Jacob. Good afternoon, councilmen and colleagues. Uh, my name is Jacob Sternberg. Uh, before I start, I would like to say I echo the words from Sarah Walsh. I felt that what she said was well written, well spoken, and represented my views as a local real estate investor here in Columbus, Ohio. I am a Columbus resident for the past 18 years. I will share with you how I trained to become a real estate investor, the role Airbnb has in my real estate portfolio, and how Airbnb trains and self-regulates the Airbnb community. This is short, I promise. <laughs> I share this information with you so that you realize that a cap would mean certain disaster for me and my family's well-being. I moved to Columbus after graduating from Kent State University in the hopes to create a life for me and my family. With several years as a banker for Chase Bank, I started a small real estate company in 2005 and made my primary Columbus residence a long-term rental after I purchased another residence. When I created my company, I did so after extensive research. I joined a local real estate investors organization, apprenticed under seasoned real estate investors, hired a real estate attorney to advise me and create my LLC, and hired a licensed CPA to help me manage my books and prepare my annual taxes. Each year I attend landlording conferences and I continue to attend weekly real estate investor meetings. As the name of my company suggests, All Affordable Housing LLC, I provide housing at a reasonable fair market price. I acquired an additional long-term rental property since this time frame in the low-income housing neighborhood of Franklinton. One half of this unit is long-term and the other half is short-term. I will now share with you how Airbnb plays a pivotal role in my real estate investment portfolio. I have been long-term landlording for the past 12 and a half years, and after upon hearing the success of a good friend of mine with his Airbnb rental, I felt comfortable and ready to pursue a new business venture by becoming an Airbnb host in April 2017. I opened up my primary Columbus residence to the Airbnb community. This decision literally would save me from bankruptcy. Months before this decision, I had a tenant, Franklinton tenant, who relapsed from his meth addiction and extensively damaged one of the rental units. The bill came to $23,000 to bring the unit rentable. 
The income I earned from Airbnb allowed me to qualify for a renovation loan and kept me afloat while the unit was vacant and not producing income. If it had not been for Airbnb, I would not have been able to renovate the property, not recoup lost rental income, and therefore a disastrous domino effect on my rental portfolio. In addition, the Airbnb income I currently earn is allowing me to stay afloat and pay my bills now that my other Franklinton tenant is having financial issues and is behind paying their rent. Their rent is $750 for a three bedroom unit. Any savvy business owner knows it's important to have multiple streams of income to keep their business running smoothly. Airbnb has proven to be an important supplemental stream of income in my business portfolio when my tenant income is lacking. My Airbnb service does not hurt the hotels, as I periodically get feedback from guests that they either could not find a hotel with the availability or one that fit their budget. I have not had a single neighbor complaint or noise violation. A cap would limit my income and limit my ability to be flexible during times of tenant rental income uncertainty. Airbnb takes an active role in training and self-regulating the Airbnb community. They do this by allowing guests and hosts to critique the other and provide online tools. The honest feedback culture promotes favorable behaviors and allowing an opportunity for improvement. For example, guests critique hosts on the following criteria, cleanliness, accuracy of the description, and responsiveness to questions. In addition, Airbnb has a super host designation for those hosts who meet even higher standards measured quarterly. I was super host el eligible within my first 90 days of service. Lastly, Airbnb has a program for successful hosts to mentor unseasoned hosts. I have mentored such a host. Following my guidance for three months, my apprentice earned his super host status in his first quarter of service. In summary, now that I have shared with you my history and experience as a local real estate investor in the Columbus market, I ask for common sense and thoughtfulness in the future regulations that you enact. A cap is unnecessary. Thank you, Jacob. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I Thank will you. move on to MJ Ashley. Someone that spelled the name Ashley, but didn't want to give their first name. At 7321 Moly. All right, we'll move on. Next is Ali Deach, followed by Brenda Ambrose. Hi, thank you. It's Aaliyah Deach. Um, no worries. <laughs> Each part spelled out for right, me. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Apologize. Um, so just to be relatively quick, I actually work at OSU and I'm not representing them, I'm just a resident here, but I came here to interview about four years ago and actually stayed in Airbnb that I ended up buying. <laughs> so I just think that that opportunity, I stayed two days in a hotel, first as part of the interview process and two days as part of a community member because I wanted to know what it was like to live here. And that gave me the opportunity and fast forward a couple of months, like I said, I ended up buying the place. Um, I do short-term, actual short-term rent my place occasionally when I travel, and for me it's been a wonderful opportunity to help welcome people back into this community, including students who have looked to whether they want to come here for either grad school or you know, postdoc opportunities, things like that. 
Um, certainly people who are graduating when their families come to visit during graduation. Um, just amazing opportunities to give back, like you were talking about, when people come here for conferences or things like that, opportunities downtown where they can't necessarily get into a hotel or they want to see what it's like to actually live here. I've heard from several people about what is it like to live here and they've, you know, so I feel like it's my opportunity to give back to those types of people. Um, I do not do it often, so I appreciate the comments um, and the opportunity to allow people like me to still do this on an actual short-term basis where it's not necessarily heavily impacting my community. Um, but I do think it's an important question that was brought up about, you know, how do we think about, you know, people who have multiple um, ways of doing this and maybe it's taking up more of like the business side of it, but there, there's, I guess there's a responsible business side of this and I feel like then there's the, you know, irresponsible. We've heard from a certain community members who have indicated that's been the case. But I think from the equitable side of it, I just want to be a little bit careful and at least ask you guys to be thinking about this question of, I mean, I think it's super important to consider who it is that we're able to rent out to from a reasonable basis, but as a homeowner, you know, there's like, I can use the rating system to indicate who uh, may or may not be a good kind of short-term tenant in my home, but it is I'm opening up my space and if I'm also not allowed to basically not allow certain people in my home. I get, it's a tricky, it's a really tough debate, right? I want to be equitable. I want to people to have an affordable way to come into this community. But if somebody has like a two star, then I end up, you know, rejecting them and not allowing them into my home. Could I then be sued for having discriminatory practices? So I just, I want to be a little bit thoughtful about that and just think, you know, how do, how do we be careful with that language that the, that it's equitable for all? I guess, from all sides of that. Um, so anyway, just a lot of different thoughts. I'll keep it short to that. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, Brenda Ambrose, followed by Tobin Ambrose. Thank you for welcoming us here today and having this forum for everybody to discuss what's going on. Um, I'm a host, a super host, and um, I feel very passionate about Airbnb. Um, for multiple reasons. Um, my husband and I have a family of four kids. Um, we've used Airbnb. My husband's been a member since 2011 as a business member, and our family has used it for vacations and other trips um, in state, out of state, all over the place. Um, we feel it's more of a bonding experience. When you go to a hotel, your kids just want to run. It's not always safe when you've got teenagers or young kids. Um, so it's more of a positive family environment to keep your kids intact, interact, and have um, some family time, bonding, campfires, things like that. Um, socially and financially, we feel Airbnb is an asset to this community. We've lived in the community. We've operated a rental unit that's a duplex for 24 years. Um, I guess we're one of the good, good hosts that exist and one of the good tenants. We've improved. Um, we put way more into our house than most of the houses in the in our neighborhood, and we've never had neighbor issues. We lived in our neighborhood before we had a rental unit, and our neighbors, like the other people I've talked about, have um, they look there are our eyes and our ears, and we've not got any calls. Um, people even say, "Oh, you're, I met your neighbor, so and so. They're great people," or "So and so was out playing the guitar, and I got to listen to him." Or we have permanent tenants in the other side of the duplex, and um, they socialize and interact with each other and mingle, and all we hear is positive, wonderful comments, both sides, tenants from the permanent tenants and from the Airbnb guest. Whenever possible, we try to meet them if we can. Um, we don't always need to, but we do set really high standards for our place. You need to have an ID on file. Um, not Airbnb doesn't require that, we require it. We don't want to ha have to go in and fix a trashed mess because someone had a party. We don't allow parties, we don't allow events. But we do allow families who are traveling with a lot of kids to stay in one location. We do allow multi-generation people to stay together in one house. Many a, many a family has brought grandparents to town who wouldn't be able to attend a high state graduation or a wedding because they couldn't handle it on their own in another area. We've had people in for college visits regularly. Um, we've had people stay because they have a sick child in a crisis situation at Children's Hospital. And um, a one week evaluation turns into a three week stay, turns into a two month stay sometimes. And we're not trying to get rich off of these people. We offer this place at a substantial discount that a hotel would never do. 
because we feel like it's a service to the community and it's the right thing to do. Um, we've had many guests in from out of the country and we really enjoy meeting them and hearing their perspectives and sending them to the local places that you've all heard about. Um, the bar down the street or the farm market, something like that. Um, We've had people in for interviews and want to stay in a neighborhood as they seek out Columbus neighborhoods and figure out where do we want to live. Um, and they're, at that time, they're also maybe doing job training or things like that. We've had professional golfers stay with us, professional football players stay with us because they don't want to be at the hotel. They want a family environment. They travel every day. My husband travels a lot. So this is one thing that's always drawn him to Airbnb. We've stayed in ones where we've stayed with families in their place just because we think it's kind of fun to get to know people. Um, not everybody does, chooses that, but it's been a positive thing for us. We've had people in town for funerals who have to come to town from all over the country to come to collect mom and dad's um, circumstances and make sense of it financially and help them move on as a family. And we feel like in those situations it's a positive um, escape for these people who come to town under less than desirable circumstances. We don't allow parties. We don't allow um, events. Um, we, have, we, we do keep ours at a two night minimum because we feel like one night invites a drunken party. Two nights, there's a little bit of kill, accountability and consciousness for what you're doing and uh -oh, we're gonna have to pay for this. So um, those are some things we do. We have security cameras in place that allow us to see, is this person on the Airbnb um, site, is that the person who actually showed up? And wait a minute, they kind of said four people were coming. We, we've monitored it, but we've never had an issue. We have never had a call from our neighbor. We lived in that neighborhood, and we have neighbors who live right next door that just say, hey, how's it going? The yard looks good, or oh, I like the new driveway. They, they compliment us on the stuff that we're bringing um, to the neighborhood with Airbnb. Um, I feel like everything we've done to our property increases the values of neighborhoods' properties because it's not a slum dwelling. It's not sitting vacant inviting drug addicts or squatters or gang activity or crime. We're upkeeping the property because you can't be a super host if that's the kind of situation you're gonna have. Um, so, and as a family, it's been a great bonding experience because our family, all four of our children have participated in all aspects of it, from um, remodeling, installing hardwood floors, painting, cleaning, changing bedding, washing, meeting hosts. They've, they've, they've participated in all aspects and our kids are learning pride for their work. They're learning, do the job right the first time. Presentation matters. A lot of things that aren't popular with teenagers these days. We feel like those values are being learned as a family and we're doing it together and we really love it. Um, as far as safety and security, another thing is um, we have a duplex. So the tenants in the other side kind of oversee it and we've never had an issue even from them. They've never ever called us and said, wait a minute, it's out of control, or oh, these guys, they're taking up all our spots. We have our own driveway, so that helps, and our guests use that driveway. Um, I don't know, it seems to me like the city should invest their time and energies and money more, more in policing and enforcing people who aren't upkeeping their property, who aren't promoting to positive improvements in a community because we feel like we're, we are doing that and it's an asset. Um, neighborhoods change over time. It's not the 50s. The, neighbor, the family unit is maybe not the same anymore and over time neighborhoods change. And some of the people I think are resistant to change and, and that's our daily life. We have, to, we have to be accepting of change and embrace it and see the positive in it some of the times. Um, I wanted to say that the um, 104 day would not work for us at all. I mean, we've only got one kid graduated from college or from high school and college. We got three more to go. We're self-employed, self entrepreneurs, and we work. We, we work to promote everything in our family's life. And we're trying to teach our kids that it's not handed to you. You work, we work more than some people, but we also play hard when we play. And the kids need to, embrace that. I mean, we can send any kid to college, but at the end of the four years, eight years, however much time they 
are there, they have debt, and they have no skills. They have no skills, and our kids are learning these skills in their home and helping promote a business that supports and supplements our family. And I think I've about covered it, but um, I'd like you to I'd like you to set really reconsider the the 104 days. It's not even feasible. So thank you for hearing my. Thank you, Brenda. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none. Tobin Ambrose. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really great to see such a nice turnout for, uh, you know, really both sides. You know, there's always two sides to every argument. And as a, uh, um, as a guest of Airbnb and a homeowner, um, you know, I would uh, uh, find it very irritating with what you guys have went through. Um, I, I, I'm curious if you've ever actually stayed in an Airbnb uh, or any short-term rental. Um, you know, a a super host is really not an easy thing to do, and, and a, and a uh, 4.8 star rating is, you know, we're like 4.9, and it's like, wow, one point, you know, is, is going to drop us down. I don't know how that would affect us, but um, I think that as a legislative push and in a market which is, you know, so vibrant as Columbus, Ohio, I really think that you might be able to kind of direct Airbnb and other platforms, and I don't do, we don't do any other platform other than Airbnb, uh, but I think you, I would like to see places where homeowners who do have complaints, because Airbnb doesn't really have that, that I've seen, um, it'd be great if they could, if they could voice those concerns and Airbnb would do something about it. Um, on the flip side of it, <clears throat> you know, 104 days wouldn't really make a difference in your in your case um, with with neighbors that are are not being uh, respectful of their property or yours really 104 days would definitely put us out of business um, we could rent our property for more than what we would get i mean 104 days is two days well it's basically every weekend throughout the month um, because like my wife said we do a two-night minimum we really don't have any problems with uh, people that are ab abusing anything. Um, you're always going to have cases where there are going to be those abuses, but if you could push Airbnb in a, in a way where, you know, they could uh, have a legitimate way to enforce some of these people that aren't doing it right, 104 days would kill most people in this room with regards to their businesses. And, and with that being said, I don't know what else we could say. And I think that's why a lot of us who have Airbnbs are here. Um, you know, we're all going to have to pay taxes. Um, my personal opinion is kind of a money grab from the city because, you know, you're you're going to be you're going to be making money on this. Um, you guys, I mean, enforcing code and regulations and making sure the alleyways are cleaned up is is I think more important than anything else because when you talk about property values, uh, when you have a rundown area where you know people aren't doing those things, that really affects those neighborhoods more than 0 .01 whatever percent it is that, you know, the people in, in, that are in this room are, are ever going to be contributing to it. So I would say try to push Airbnb for um, the problems. Let us run our businesses. You know, we, we've made major investments with, with our neighborhood. Um, we, like my wife said, we lived in the area, so we actually know a lot of these people, we lived there, and it's in Clintonville, for 10 years. So they have our phone number. We haven't had any complaints. I think this, the two-night stay is a really important thing to, to thwart some of that bad behavior. Um, if, if I had a choice, what are we going to limit? I'd say if you're non-owner occupied, limit the, the number of, you know, maybe we don't allow one-night stays. I don't know. I mean, to me, it seems... Like, if you're not at the property, um, that's one way to get rid of some of the problems. I don't know if that's an option or not, but if, if, uh, if I had a choice, I would go with no one-night stays versus a 104-day limit because it's usually three-day, four-day bookings. We don't do, like I said, one day. So with that being said, thanks again. And Thank you for the testimony. 
Any questions or comments? Seeing none, next is Lisa Craig Morton, and following Lisa will be Joseph uh, Montrone, turn 1128G Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., from Expedia. Yes, Lisa. Thank you for having this forum this evening. My name is Lisa Craig Morton, and I own Victorian Village Guest House. I've been in the hospitality and tourism business for over 10 years now. And when I started this, I spent about half my time explaining to people what I was doing because Airbnb and those online platforms did not exist. So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I am listed on Airbnb, although it is not my primary source of customers. I'm listed on HomeAway and VRBO, where I'm a premier property with 113 five-star ratings. I've never had anything but a five-star rating. So we don't really have any problems with our guests and our neighbors because of that. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the hospitality profession. I'm a member, very proud member of the Ohio Hotel and Lodging Association and Experience Columbus. And it's, um, it's very encouraging to hear all the other hosts sharing their stories. I've had many positive experiences like they have. I'm very supportive of your proposed legislation. There are two areas that I think could use some additional um, fine tuning. The first one has to do, and a couple other people have mentioned this, with how you define an owner-occupied property. My property is one parcel because we went through the process of having um, a carriage house built that is a legal dwelling. It's zoned as a dwelling. Technically, my property is a duplex, and my guest house is in the carriage house. So I live in the main house that faces Neal Avenue, and our guest house is in the carriage house in the back. So I think that fine-tuning that wording would help um, clarify what really owner-occupied, what you mean by that. The other area has to do with the number of days. Um, and I think that what I would encourage council and, and the mayor's staff to look at is, what are you really trying to get at? Um, We've heard a lot of people who have a handful of properties, maybe one or two, they live in part of it, they rent out the other side, and they have a couple other properties as well. I think those people are the kind of people that we want to encourage and not limit their business activities. We also know that in Columbus, there are large apartment complexes that are being built where a developer is going in and building a brand new building with 200 units, and right off the bat, they're setting off 25% of that as an Airbnb or as Airbnb listings. And that, my friends, is a de facto hotel, and it should be legislated and regulated as such. So I think that it's really important that we discern the difference between those two, and does the 104-day limit, it, it, are you trying to get at those people who are operating de facto hotels? Are you trying to get at absentee landlords? Are you trying to get at what? And I'm not sure the 104-day limit is the way to skin that cat. So. Um, I'm absolutely opposed to absentee landlords. I'm opposed to apartment complexes renting out 50 units as an unregulated hotel. But I'm not opposed to my colleagues who are doing this and owning you know, maybe a handful of properties in my neighborhood. And they're my friends and neighbors, and they're doing it responsibly. So I would encourage you to look at that. One of the cities that you might consider looking at is Seattle's legislation, where I think they have something called like a one plus one um, rule where you can have a unit in your owner occupied and then you can have another unit um, that's a non owner occupied. And, and as a small business person and entrepreneur, operate that. I'm not sure one plus one is the right formula. Maybe it's one plus three or one plus four, but I think you can understand what I'm getting at. So I appreciate you taking this on. I absolutely approve of the regulatory aspect of it. I approve of having guests register. I urge you to get the platforms to collect and remit the taxes on behalf of the, the hosts and the property owners. And thank you so much for the time and effort you've put into this and the open way in which you've handled it. Thank you, Lisa. Next is Joseph, followed by Rachel Jones. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Joseph Montano. I'm here representing Expedia. I'm the government affairs manager at the risk of drawing the ire of the council. Can, can I actually just thank the city staff for setting up this amazing event? I used to be a, let's give it up for them. I mean, I used to be a congressional staffer and seeing somebody just opening up chairs frantically reminded me of those days. So we don't give enough thanks to these unsung heroes. 
Um, so on behalf of the Expedia family of brands that include Vacation Rental Leaders Home Away and VRBO, Vacation Rental by Owner, I'm here to just express a few concerns with the legislation. I know that we've touched on the nightcap issue, and I think folks here have spoken so eloquently about that, that it's ineffective and it's unenforceable. So I'll move on past that just to make this quick. What I really want to touch on is more of the platform liability aspect of this. So this bill would force short-term rental platforms to divulge private identi identifiable information, such as the name and address of the operator, and it's not limited to just that. And forcing platforms to disclose personally identifiable information uh, could run, without a legal process, such as a warrant or a subpoena, could run afoul of the Stored Communications Act, which is a federal law. So that's the only concern I have there. Furthermore, the legislation mandates that the hosting platform police short-term rentals by somehow requiring them to be valid before the listing. Uh, the problem, this is problematic for a number of reasons. One of which being there's no mechanism for the hosting platform to verify the existence of this registration permit. And even then, ascertaining its validity is even more problematic from there. Um, so that's the, the second issue that we have with this. And lastly, it's important to note that for generations, whole home vacation rentals have been a part of the Columbus landscape, tourism landscape. Uh, for a bit of background, in 2015, Expedia acquired HomeAway and VRBO because it caters to a special type of traveler. It caters to a family of four. It's usually a middle-aged woman, 50 years old, traveling with a family of four. So we cater to families. These aren't the folks burning down the neighborhoods. These aren't the folks causing all the problems. But when we've seen this arise, and we've been in operation for over 30 years, and when we see these complaints, you know, the Gerbers, uh, it's a very sympathetic note, and I feel for you, we actually created a platform uh, called stayneighborly.com to address these types of issues where community members, legislators can come about and, and really tell us if it's a home away or VRBO property, the address on there, the complaints that you have, we will then have our internal customer service folks reach out to those folks who are causing these problems. We don't want uh, the bad apples ruined for the whole bunch. Nobody here does. We are all for uh, responsible short-term renting, and we're all for legislating the matter in that way. So anything that we can do to help the city create an effective policy that's fair and sensible, we're here to do so. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Rachel Jones, then Vernon Morrison. My name is Linda Jones. Thanks for the opportunity. It's actually Rachel Jones. We're Rachel, not to you yet, Linda. I'm sorry. Okay. But okay, Rachel will yield girl. to you. Yield, go ahead. I'll make it real quick. I've been a resident for 62 years in Clintonville. We have rentals all over the place. They're usually long term, but with the ARB, BMB, I, I just see it as a way to promote our city. 40, 104 day limitation on any business is suicide. I've been a small business owner myself. I was able to deal with maintaining our business from my residence and I just think that 104 days got to go. It's, it's not on target at all. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Jones followed by Vernon Morrison. I am relatively new to VRBO. I have been a host um, since February, now a proud super host. Um, we got into the um, VRBO, home away, Airbnb business because we had tenants who did not have a lease because they've been with us for numerous years and they moved out around the holidays. And usually I list it for 48 hours on a typical rental, even you know Craigslist, Facebook, and I've got like two dozen people in 48 hours. Well, when you, um, November, like early um, November isn't a huge time to get a lot of rentals. So for two weeks, it was crickets. Third week, I had one person. So we decided during the holidays to go ahead and try out the Airbnb thing. Um, we were unaware our, um, when we first got started how much of an investment it would take to make a five-star super host kind of place. Um, but once you get that ball rolling, you can't really go back. So we have um, invested a lot of money and time into making our Airbnb a place that would be respectful for the neighborhood as well as trying to get a five-star guest. Um, we have a number of decorations of art that are all, um, of local artists. We have a number of guests coming and asking for like where to buy this or that in our home. Um, as already stated by this lady in the front row, um, we have people and who are staying. So it has someone. It's a. I live in an owner-occupied duplex. I do have a concern about. We have a distinct address from our next door. There are two complete separate addresses. Um, that being said, I can attest to the fact that myself and my long-term neighbors previously 
um, in no way were able to use the businesses that are in Clintonville the way that my Airbnb guests are using them on a daily basis. But you're able to promote local businesses, coffee shops, bakeries, breweries in a way that when you're a long-term renter, you're just kind of living there and maybe saving money. Um, I also have two young children. My biggest concern is the ki is the noise that my kids make, not my guests. Um, no one's crying. No one's. It's past seven. Stop crying. But we have um, our guests have been other than one in the very beginning, and I learned my lesson super early, but we don't allow parties, I didn't then either. Um, but I've learned some tricks about having better tenants. When you invest the kind of money that you invest, you don't want someone to come and to disrupt your furniture, your art, your dishes, your brand new carpet, like you just don't have time to reinvest or time to flip between people in a way that would allow you to have a five star rating. Um, and as far as I think that um, Ms. Beck said that part of the reason for the day cap is that there's a neighborhood character and fiber that is in place and Airbnbs can disrupt that. I live in a duplex. Next to me on both sides are single family homes. On both sides of that are other duplexes. On my street are a number of quad, single family and duplexes. There is no presumption on my street in Clintonville of all single family long term stays. And obviously that's not the case for neighborhoods across all of Columbus, but there's a ton of diversity in Grandview, well, the Columbus part, but like Victorian Village, Columbus, that I feel like um, somebody coming and going in the middle of the night would be a normal, a normal scenario. My biggest problem in my neighborhood are long-term college students that are across the street and three doors down, and they've been there for two years and they're not gonna go anywhere. Um, I feel like I've had just a great experience. Um, also, just from a business standpoint, I've already um, addressed how it puts money back into the community. It's allowed me to stay home with my two kids if I wasn't able to have the money coming in from the Airbnb, that would definitely be um, a game changer. And some people talked about having their first family home and how important that is. Um, I never wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. I can never imagine that being an option for my family. I've also grown up in Columbus, um, and having an Airbnb has allowed us to have a business that I never thought was possible from our own point of view. As a duplex, we would one day, potentially, um, buy another property, either for ourselves or for another investment. So it scares me from the side that, as of right now, this might not impact me, but it also um, locks me into a duplex with my two kids, who are both girls, in a one bathroom for the rest of my life, and I'm not up for that. Um, we are. Mrs. He'll, Jones in that situation. Mr. Jones will speak in June. Um, and as far as the, the days of the caps, I think if you're worried about parties and neighborhoods being disrupted, I don't see why 104 would be the number. It seems like the 261 of the weekdays of trying to get people Monday through Friday, that, that, that just makes more sense to me on a daily logical basis. Um, I do feel for the people in the neighborhoods that are all single family homes, but um, again, I think that the, the noise and the issues in my neighborhood aren't from the guests who also want to have their own five star rating. I think that someone else mentioned that um, Airbnb and all of the platforms allow you to be rated as a host, so you want to keep your home and yard in impeccable condition. But as a guest, you're constantly worried about maintaining your own reputation to get further rentals in the future. So I feel like it's a better platform than having rentals, which I've had for the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next is Vernon Morrison. We have about seven more to go. Unfortunately, the rec center technically closes at eight. They're being willing to accommodate us. I want to remind everyone there will be an additional hearing Thursday, June 14th. So if there's anyone that's willing that did a speaker slip, we will have you speak early uh, in that regard. Otherwise, we will continue. Mr. I'll, Morris? I'll be pretty brief. Um, Vicki Deisner. As, as you mentioned, the June 14th meeting, that's going to be in German Village, and I, and I live in German Village. and. Uh, it is certainly a living museum, and if you look at the Air, Airbnb and a lot of VRBO, there was a number of units in the city of or in v German Village, and actually, I think it adds to the character. We have tourists that are down there visiting. It's certainly strengthened property values, and certainly, uh, you know, enabled uh, a diverse community, which I which I moved to on purpose. One of the things I would like to mention. 
we're investing a lot of time of the cities, a lot of time of staff, and you're talking about one-tenth of one percent of the homes available in the city. If you increase that by a thousand percent, you still wouldn't even be talking about one percent of the housing stock that's in the city of Columbus. So I think we're spending a lot of excess city resources on a, on a problem that's really not a problem. And I think council should certainly take that into consideration, including staff, when you're setting up a lot of the regulatory regime, um, setting up, you know, the process to get your permits. It sounds like somebody's got to come down to the office and bring their insurance and proof of ownership when many of the items like proof of ownership is online at the county auditor's website. Um, insurance, I'm not sure why the, why the city is concerned if somebody has the proper insurance because that's not their risk or liability. It's the person that owns the property's risk and liability. I think you could certainly streamline some of this operational effort and make it much more simplistic and, and obviously make it easier for the residents of, the, of your constituency and, and maintaining proper um, units availability and, and make it a good, co a good compromise between the city's needs of additional revenue and the community's and people's needs. But again, I think we have to focus and concentrate on such a small number of issues. If you looked at all the people talked tonight, there were two people that have had issues and everybody else had a great situation. I think we kind of got the cart before the horse personally. Thank you. Thank you. Vicki, next is Jay Lisk. I'm um, Council President Pro Tem Stinziano and Councilman. I'm Vicki Diesner, a Columbus resident located at 824 South Front Street, Columbus, in the Brewery District by German Village. I come before you today to offer testimony on the changes to the city code as they relate to the growing short-term rental industry proposed by the City of Columbus, and thank you for taking the lead on this important issue. I applaud the City of Columbus for addressing this growing issue, as I can share with you that my neighbors and I have personally experienced the downside of the unregulated growth of this industry. Our neighbor, just south of my property at 828 South Front Street, turned his property, which he does not reside in, into an Airbnb about a year ago. The owner at 828 South Front Street in the Brewery District does not live in the City of Columbus. He lives in Pataskala. He is basically an absentee owner. Care of the property is limited, such as yard care, and often there is dark garbage cans overflowing for weeks on end. But it is also apparent there are no guidelines given to renters, or for that matter, the property owner, who is his son, who does not reside there also. Last July 4th, there were over 40 people at a party, his son, and renters had to celebrate the city's fireworks. And not only was there a van in front of our property with a boom box, and people on our property without permission, the occupancy legally set off large fireworks on our property that caught fire, not more than 10 feet from the door of our house. This is not acceptable and is extremely dangerous. And when we try to contact the property owner regarding issues such as the fireworks fiasco or contractors he has hired that enter our property without permission or consent, he cannot be reached for weeks, if at all. City action is needed to regulate this industry. My neighbors and I strongly support the proposed regulations that impose taxes on these short-term rentals, require a permit, proof of liability, and provide for complaint-driven investigations and inspections that could include fines, jail time, permit, suspension, revocation, or denial for violations. However, based on our personal experience with this property owner who does not occupy the property and is nowhere near the property, we would ask that the proposed regulations be amended to deny short-term rental of property that is not occupied by the owner, or as many people have talked tonight, find a way around this. Obviously, what we've heard tonight is people whose property that they rent and is close to them in their neighborhood, um, maybe it's your duplex, maybe it's across the street, it's down the street, it's part of your neighborhood, it's part of your fabric. You care and you're taking care of those properties. But obviously with the Gerbers and what I've experienced and others, if that absentee owner is far away, they do not care. So please, please address this. Thank you for your consideration of this issue and taking a lead on this important matter. Thank you, Vicki. Jay Lisk, followed by Robert Ellis. Hey, guys. Um, my name is Jay Lisk. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Columbus native, and um, I run uh, an Airbnb. And uh, I just wanted to uh, come down and give my two cents. Thank you for allowing me. Um, I oppose the current uh, proposals uh, as written, and I, I just would like to explain why. Um, 
I think I speak for the entire Airbnb community when I say that, or at least most of us, um, I welcome uh, city regulation. I welcome taxation. Um, I run a legitimate business, uh, and I have no problem with those things. What I object to is uh, that the current uh, proposal functions pretty much as a ban. 104 days, uh, that puts me out of business. Um, I mean, I'll come back to this subject, but I would like to uh, explain a little bit about who I am and what my operation is, and just so you have a sense of uh, who it is that's being affected by these things. Uh, my husband and I own property on Latta Avenue in Columbus. Uh, Latta is a little, uh, short little street, about three blocks long. It runs from Broad Street uh, to Oak Street in Old Town East. Um, and when I got there in 2011, I, I live about, I don't know, five blocks from there on Bryden Road. When I got there in 2011, I think if you imagine like a blighted neighborhood during the foreclosure crisis, you, you pretty much picture Latta Avenue. Uh, I want to say on our side of the block, there were two houses, maybe three that were inhabited. Uh, the rest of them were all abandoned. The windows were broken out. The uh, windows were boarded up. Everything that was inside that uh, was made of metal had been stolen. The plumbing, the electric, the, uh, the wiring, all the air conditioners uh, carried off by thieves. Um, I saw opportunity, though. It was a beautiful street, had beautiful old brick houses. There were trees. And I felt like here's you know a long-term investment. And so we bought a couple of properties on Lada Avenue. And I renovated them with my hands, with a hammer and uh, myself, and put a, poured a lot of blood and sweat and money and my, a lot of myself into these properties. Um, times have changed a bit since then. Uh, we've got, you know, we, we've got six units there, and things have improved enough in the neighborhood to the point where we can, uh, you know, we, we no longer have trouble attack, attracting tenants. We, we uh, and we, we've got two of these units that have been converted over to Airbnbs. Um, and th this is just like our way of having like a diverse portfolio in our long-term investment. We're, we're not converting these into some sort of illegal hotel. This is, th these two Airbnb units are just, are just some of the things we do, but we're here for the long haul. We, we, we believe in this, the city of Columbus. We believe in Old Town East. We believe in Latta Avenue. And frankly, these two Airbnb units, they, they are our most profitable units. Um, but uh, we have no plans to convert the other four units over to Airbnb. Um, because the, the Airbnb units, they, they're also a lot of work. Um, the block still has a long way to go. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, there, there's still an abandoned house next door to us. I mean, it's still boarded up. Um, I think there's a lot of suggestion that Airbnb units are, are, you know, depriving people of affordable housing. Well, there's still plenty of housing stock in my neighborhood that has yet to be, you know, done anything with. Um, My Airbnb, I've, I, no one has ever complained about any of my guests. I mean, I live five blocks away. Um, I sympathize with what the previous uh, speaker, her experience, and, and what the Gerbers have experienced. Um, you know, there's, there's bad apples out there in this world. I mean, I certainly don't run my show that way. Um, my, my guests are not the creepy people of America. Um, my guests are just normal people. They're, they're, they're in town for a wedding or a convention or for graduation or they're visiting their family or they're just everyday people. They come from all over the world and uh, they stay with me because, you know, I offer them lodging that has like more charm and more character than a hotel can provide and, and I can do it for a better price. And, and I, I can, they, they stay with me and, and they live in an actual neighborhood and, and, and they, they leave me with an impression of what Columbus actually is. And I, I don't think you get that in a hotel. Um, this, this current proposal, it puts me out of business. You know, it just is not economical. 104 days a year, it just, there's no way that I can stay in this business. I, I will have to do something else. And um, I just want to protest. Uh, I, I think this, this day limit on non-owner-occupied units, it's, it's, I think it's arbitrary. Um, 
I mean, if council wishes to ban, you know, my kind of small business, I, I wish council would just do that. I don't, I don't see how this 104-day uh, limit in any way solves any of the problems that have been brought up with with Airbnb. I, uh, council President Harden asked Mr. Uh, Savarisi uh, that question: how how the 104-day uh, ban would deal with it, and he sidestepped it because there's doesn't seem to be any relation to the 104-day limit to the problems that are, you know, being floated out there. Um, I, I just, I, I think we have to think about what it is that we're, 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 we're doing, where we're going as a city. Um, I stay in Airbnbs when I travel. I never stay in a hotel. I would never stay in a hotel if I could help it. Uh, a hotel is, you know, a hotel room is a tiny little cramped box with bad art on the wall. It's just like every other hotel room. Um, it's twice as expensive as an Airbnb. Um, they nickel and dime you for Wi-Fi. Um, who the hell would want to stay in an Airbnb? I mean, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, stay in Airbnbs when they travel. Um, I, I think if we put this legislation through, uh, we're going to be limiting uh, the people who can come to Columbus, people who want to come to come Columbus. I mean, Airbnb is a remarkable tool, and it is you know, and it's coupled with remarkable technology, and I think that we have to think who we are as a city. We're trying to lure, you know, Amazon to open a second campus here in Columbus. Um, where are we going? Are we siding with the future, or are we siding with, you know, a tired business model? Um, I think Airbnb is the future, and I think uh, that that's the way we ought to go. So I'm asking you guys, this 104-day limit, it's going to put me out of business. Please don't put me out of business. Thank you. So just to clarify, since you mentioned Amazon, you'd support a Seattle model? I'm sorry? You would support the model that Seattle adopted? Well, I just stayed in an Airbnb in Seattle. It was lovely. I, can't, I, don't, think the, I, I don't know exactly what the uh, rules are in Seattle. <laughs> I think that might be a little bit of a leap, Mr. Cinziano. I'm just, just curious. <laughs> Thank you. you. Compared it. Next, we have Robert Ellis, followed by Ian Thixton. Sorry. All right. Um, I'm here just as a more of a commercial operator. Um, I sell apartment complexes. I sell a lot of investment properties. A lot of the underwriting that our clients do is for commercial properties. I'm here just representing that kind of interest. Um, I'm here to lend a helping hand and be any be a point of contact for you guys. I use a professional manager for all of my Airbnb properties. Um, my manager manages 228 units across eight markets in the country. Um, because of the proposed legislations, I've started to look at other markets. Um, in a market like Philadelphia, last Friday I leased three apartments and I can go into an apartment complex, lease them and Airbnb. I have to give personal guarantees on them. That'll cost me $25,000 to launch, but for me it is a business, so because of that I have certain startup costs and things like that. So there's definitely some kind of regulation that can be, but there's other markets that are so far ahead of us. Key West, Florida, and the state of Florida, they ruled legislation that says prior to 2011, um, unless there was some kind of ban or any since then, there's no further legislation. So we're looking in markets like Tampa or Miami. And even within Miami, there's certain regulations and things like that. So I think you can compare it to, to ones around the country. I don't think it, you know, for people like me, you know, I have, I own three units. I lease two apartments or three apartments here. And what I've seen, probably the majority, like t someone talked about AirDNA, probably 70% of the top 100 rankings for Airbnb properties per Air, per AirDNA, AirDNA or in the urban core. You know, I think like not, not a lot of them are in Hilliard, although I think they perform well everywhere. The majority of mine are in also very transient areas. I have three in the university district. So I think there's some thought should be given to overlays and neighborhood areas. Um, I'd say the, the owner occupant status in an area like the university district is very low. Um, I do think that there's certain, like my plan was to do 10 units here and then scale to other markets. So I think there could be some levels of threshold and maybe like certain tiers of 
permits that do it. I know the auditor requires a rental registration for apartment owners or non-owner occupied properties. I'm in full support of that. I've stayed in an Airbnb for as cheap as $12 in Dallas. They had like 17 bunks in one house. Those are the slum ones. I'm a super cheap person, so I've been in those. And I've talked to people that have spring break rentals in Orlando that they have like bunks stacked in the rooms. And I think, I think an annual checkup and regulation and self-regulation is very important. I would never want to stay in something like that unless it was a hostel or something like that that has a proper registration for it. But for someone like me, and I've looked at doing that. Right when I started, I had a duplex that has six bedrooms on campus each side. And I decided to go the route of single bookings, and we book anywhere between 200 and 500 a night. But I have units that book for $50 a night, you know? Um, so I don't, I think like I'm just here to be like a sounding board. I'm here to, like I'm, I am a for-profit entity. This is something I invest a substantial amount of money in. Um, in terms of lease agreements, furniture, furniture has no value. I, anyone that's bought a couch and sold it for more, please let me know. <laughs> it's depreciate, you know, it's a depreciation schedule. It's a business. So I think in terms of that, like, I'm just here to provide that. I haven't heard one person that's for the 104 ban since I've been sitting here, the 24 people. It's either a complete ban or a non, or a, you know, the no, no person, not one person here. I think it's overwhelming that there's no support for the ban. I don't know where it came from, and I don't think there should be a ban. I think you should work with some of the leaders, including myself. There's a, guy, there's a gentleman that wants to speak here that owns three and manages 10. You know, people like that that, that have a very good tune on what's happening. Um, you know, everyone has a story. I had a couple of bodybuilders that called the police on a party in the university district. I know the owner of the property. I called them up. They shut down the party with the police. There's proper... For, for the Gerbers or whoever else, there's proper noise complaints, nuisances, things like that to take care of issues. Um, in terms of the for-profit entities as well, people buy long-term rentals in any neighborhood in Columbus. There's no ban on that. It's the same thing. You could buy every house in a neighborhood and have it as a long-term rental. You have the same issues with, with that. And I think, personally, when I go to owners, I lease apartments for, I think you can, any kind of restriction on for, on for-profit entities is very difficult. There's a thousand different ways. You can have employees that live in the property. You can lease apartments in your own name and company names. You can create a new LLC for every entity. There's a thousand ways to do it. You know, I think any kind of regulations that try to restrict who's going to, like not like non-owner occupants, is going to be very difficult because of people like myself that are just, like, you know, I'm not trying to work around the system. I, I intended to get a permit and anything, everything like that. But, you know, people like me, I'm, I actually was signing lease agreements with other for-profit entities. I'm taking the, the campus units that weren't leased, four bedrooms for 1500 a month in the university district, an area that I understand. And because of some of the legislation that's been proposed, I wasn't able to do that. I'm sure they'll be able to lease it and, you know, but I think that it's a free market, and I believe in capitalism personally. So it, for me, that's a lot of my comments. It's just I'm here to be a helpful that I can. Um, I think any motel or hotel could also list on the platforms as well, and every apartment complex could as well. A lot of the ones in Philadelphia that we're looking at, there's certain um, triggers. They can't be a certain percentage or else they're considered a motel or a hotel, and then that's different financing, different insurance, everything like that. I don't know who said uh, about the liability insurance, but I'm all for that as well. I think it's important to it. Um, but I think a, I think it's important to do that. And there's definitely developers that want to do a, you know, they have a weekly rental proposed in Harrison West right now that I think they're planning to do mostly Airbnb rentals. There's about, I forget, 26 or 42 apartments there. And, you know, something like that can definitely affect the neighborhood there. But so I think at a certain level or scale, my recommendation is 10, because that's what I was going to do. You need to, you need to have like <laughs> different permits. But I, I'm here to be a sounding board too. If you guys have questions, or I can connect you with some of those people to get a better knowledge, so that you can understand it. I think the people that are in this room are the people that understand it the best. I don't know if you guys have Airbnb properties, but I'm sure if you did, you wouldn't want the 104 ban either. So if not, hey, I'll help you start one on the side, and then we can do that. So um, I think that was. I think that was most of it. I think um, I'm approachable as a host as well. I'd be 
perfectly fine with anyone contacting me with a concern about a guest or a, or someone staying there. I, I, I identify with that comment. And um, I think, you know, the rental contact has a fee for not registering, so I think you could do the same thing for Airbnb. I think there's over 75,000 rental units that are registered in the auditor's site. You can call and ask them, but I have the list if you want it. And that is, that's all I have, so I appreciate it. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Ian, followed by Ingrid Navano. Hi there, Ian Thixton. Um, I operate a half of a duplex, a uh, four bedroom, two and a half bath, um, and we don't just uh, rent out to people who are coming in for concerts or football games, but we actually get a large number um, of renters that are here for medical reasons. Maybe they have certain restrictions in their diet that they have to cook a certain way. They want their entire family to come in um, so that their dad can receive chemotherapy treatment over Christmas or Thanksgiving. We have that almost every year. Um, and so I guess it does not just affect the partiers. Um, it would also affect maybe people who are here for different reasons, um, whether that be medical or um, business related. Anyway, thank you. Ingrid, followed by Brian Williamson. Hi, I'm Ingrid Navarro, and um, I'm sorry I'm going to read because I need to stay focused and get everything out. Um, so I'm here to share my experience as a small business owner. My husband, Mike, and I, we own and operate several short-term rentals in the short north area, and we've been doing this since 2015. Um, this is our full-time occupation, and we support our family of six on the rental income, and we also live in the short north. Um, we started as short-term rental host by renovating a boarded-up house that w had been vacant for five years, and the home was next to um, another home that was also boarded up, so we bought that one and did the same thing. And uh, we gradu gradually converted two of our long-term rentals that were duplexes to short-term rentals because we enjoyed it so much and we took better care of our properties. Um, and then like you know it's been three years now and we employ two cleaners full-time and a host assistant year-round and um, we also hire multiple uh, local area maintenance services so suffice to say we've spent countless number of hours managing our apartments we've spent thousands and thousands of dollars um, renovating and maintaining them and you know we do what every other host does um, we implement a number of safety measures from security systems um, to you know making sure they're, they have working fire alarms, fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide detectors, and we enforce a huge um, set of rules to ensure the safety of our guests and the safety of neighbors. And um, you know we carry the proper insurance on them. There's just a ton of, of extensive lists and a ton of fixed expenses that go along with uh, running a short-term rental. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the concerns of potential negative impacts of short-term rentals on the neighborhood that neighbors have concerns with um, as far as partying and short-term rental units taking over. Um, this is drastically different from what I've experienced as a host and also as a resident. Um, first of all, the real estate market in the short north area, as we all know, is super expensive and that's where the majority of the short term rentals are and that's, that's where the supply and the, the demand is. And um, it's very cost prohibitive to um, investors seeking to, prevent, to convert properties into short term rentals. Um, that market will self adjust. I mean, right now the supply is really high, so the demand or the, the cost for a nightly stay has gone very low. And even us, we are um, selling two properties this year because it's just not economically feasible to sustain these properties as short-term rentals. So I first see a number of short-term rentals exiting the market, but I believe that that market will adjust itself. If anything, though, the having short-term rentals in our neighborhood has increased safety and increased property values due, the, due to increased presence of hosts on the property versus a typical long-term uh, landlord. The pride of ownership and the level of effort put into these rentals is much higher. And I know this because I've seen it, I've done it, and I also pay for it through increased property um, taxes. And 
so I know that the value of my home's gone up, but also the value of our neighborhood has gone up as a whole. And I know this for a fact, the majority of short-term rentals are kept in equal, if not better condition than most properties. Okay, who's coming into the short-term uh, rentals? The majority of our guests are families, business travelers, and guests traveling for medical reasons. And then there's also many local businesses that have rented our apartments to host get-togethers, workshops, um, and even as a backdrop for uh, professional commercials. And we do, we do host bachelorette parties and um, birthday get-togethers, but not as hosting it in our house. It's basically a meeting point, and they go out, and then they come back, and they stay the night. Um, and the positive I see of this is that they're not drinking and driving and driving home to the suburbs where a lot of them live or, you know, through, they, they come from throughout Ohio. Um, but the way I see it is they're spending more money and more time in our restaurants and in the downtown area. And in the three years that we've been hosts, we've had over a thousand reservations. And of those reservations, only seven of them, we have filed official complaints through Airbnb and VRBO. And of the three of them were related to drinking and partying. And all those happened um, on our campus, Airbnb. But we've never had the police called to any of our residences by neighbors ever. And in fact, we live right next to one of them. And we don't tell guests that we live there unless we run into them and meet them. And we have, haven't had a problem with them. So, um, and in fact, the neighbor on the other side of that house has rented from us this summer. So. Um, if that doesn't say something. And specifically about the 104-day band, um, and that essentially limits hosts to renting on Friday and Saturday, so that wouldn't, like as others had said, it's not gonna curtail um, parties if that's the underlying reason for having the 104-day ban. Bottom line is we've done our part as responsible small business owners. We are 100% in support of the, the legislation proposing taxes and registering our properties and complying with safety measures. We see ourselves as an integral part of the tourism here in the city and we are constantly promoting businesses throughout Columbus. Many times we've been told by our guests that the area's hotels are booked and how much more affordable they are than ho hotels and how much families and groups enjoy staying at one of our apartments together in one space. Um, and I've had many business travelers tell me that they would prefer not to stay in a hotel because they have to so often. Um, and so if you ban the, the short-term rentals with the 104-day limit, you're taking away a key part of tourism in the city as well as my family's means of financial stability as well as the countless other people that depend or employed by uh, short-term rental uh, property owners. So we're all pushing for the growth of our city in a positive manner, and um, thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Brian Williamson, followed by Jordan Frum. Thank you. Thank you for having this forum uh, for us to voice our um, concerns about the legislation. Um, to just echo what everyone has, else has already said, the 102 or 104 days um, isn't a solution. It's not a solution that will uh, bring about change for the people who are mostly concerned, specifically the Gerbers. Thank you for staying, actually. I, this has been a long evening, and I'm sure in opposition to, to what you're hearing, that's appreciated to you know, hear the, the other side. Um, I just, I mean, even if you went down to the 60 days that you were proposing or something less, I mean, I don't know, everyone who lives here knows how long winter is. I think it's about 60 days or 90, I don't know, but it seems like it's forever. So it doesn't matter how long it's going to last, uh, 20 weekends or 120 or the 52 of the year. It's going to seem like it lasts forever. So don't, is, don't let's not regulate for just that specific reason. Um, things that my wife, the reason um, we're in this is because we wanted financial freedom for ourselves and our future. And real estate and Airbnb specifically has given that to us. Um, so it would kill our business. And please. 
like he said, don't kill our business. <laughs> Thank you. Jordan Frohm, followed by Mark Wolf. Members of council, thanks for having us today. And to city staff, I appreciate you pulling all this together as well. Um, so just, you don't really need to do a show of hands, but they show of hands, how many people here have had Chipotle? Probably everybody here. Uh, who here has had a bologna sandwich from Zeno's? Anybody? Well, pro I've probably sold about 200 of them to my guests. Uh, I live around the corner. I love their bologna sandwich, mushrooms, onions, mustard. Um, I, I didn't want to host. I bought a house and I overpaid and I love it and I had a, I had a financial crisis and I got married to an immigrant who we had IR attorneys and all sorts of stuff hit the fan and I uh, had to rent out a room in my house. Um, I was compelled to sign up to speak probably at the end of this, uh, this list because I was hearing a lot of hosts that bought a house or they had a duplex, or they had a carriage house. I have a mother-in-law suite in my house. Um, I work for a company. I'm not an entrepreneur. Um, if I need extra cash, I drive Lyft and Uber. I did this to be able to meet my mortgage payments and sell, I guess sell these bologna sandwiches. They're really good. Um, but I've had 350 plus guests. I've had, hosted 30 countries. I just had a lady leave from Azerbaijan Yesterday, that's 31 countries. I've learned so much. I've introduced these people to my neighborhood. I've introduced them to my restaurants in my neighborhood. My neighbors know who I am. I talk to my neighbors. They have my number. Um, I have made enough money not only to cover my mortgage, but now I can make investments in my home. I build a new deck. I renovated an $8,000 backyard renovation that I utilize. My guests don't party there because I don't permit it. Partially because my neighbors said, you know, we're fine if you decide to do this, but just don't throw that party. You know, we've heard about that. So what I've been hearing throughout this afternoon or evening or midnight at this point <laughs> is that uh, a lot of this comes down to communication. Uh, communication is the key to success and communication is the key to failure. And if you're going to be in business, your responsibility is to build relationships with those that you do business with and you do business alongside of. And if you're in a zoning district that's residential and you rent a room out of your house or you rent an entire home, you have a responsibility to build relationships with your community, which is part of what we've advocated with the city to con con uh, consider community standards um, that being a good neighbor, whether or not you live on the property, and I can't s see from your perspective because I don't have a house in a neighborhood I don't live in. I have a house I live in, so I can't relate. But I can relate with communication. So I think that that's a significant consideration that we need to be spending a lot of resources in, is encouraging our guests not only to communicate, or host to communicate, but to have dialogue. Um, the final two things that I wanted to indicate were, I heard a comment about da, uh, you know, having kids and family friendly and looking at the, um, the protected classes. At least in my experience as a host, um, I have a dog and uh, I have stairs and um, it's not really conducive particularly to families. So I tell them, you can stay if you decide to, but you need to understand what you're listing. So I make, a, I make a presentation to my prospective guests what they're getting into. They have a responsibility to read everything, and I have a responsibility to communicate that. That's the same allow allowance of communication that I afford to my neighbors. The final aspect that I, I really enjoy hearing this evening is the tax collection aspect. Let's pay taxes. What, we're not hiding from taxes, but let the platform carry that burden and work with the city to do so. There are so many guest hosts like me who needed to make some money who don't even realize the circumstances around tax payment and remittance. They don't understand how to do that and they're, they're not informed to do it. Uh, these platforms have demonstrated with cities around the country that it's possible to do so without putting hosts through a circumstance of paying taxes that they didn't even know that they needed to do because they just heard about it. It's a, it's a pitfall because it's an attractive platform. Finally, using that tax and allocating it towards objectives such as 
affordable housing is so critical. You look at an issue such as you're removing housing stock from neighborhoods and needing to allocate that cash towards, or the, that housing stock towards affordable housing issues. Well, I live in the short north. Nobody was going to live in my basement. <laughs> you know, so why don't we take that cash and advocate to invest in communities around Central Ohio, neighborhoods throughout our neighborhoods, um, low income to high income, and create opportunities for people to invest in their lives and be stable in their housing for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mark Wolf, followed by Benjamin Vale. Hello. It's, uh, it's late, so I'll be brief. Um, my name's Mark. I'm a uh, licensed real estate broker. And I am also a super host on Airbnb. And um, I could talk all day about, you know, what Airbnb does for people, but we've already heard that. Um, so there's a place in the market for Airbnb, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon, um, or at least sh short-term, you know, rentals. Um, I feel for the Gerber family because that, you know, if you're being disturbed that much, um, that's 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 no fun. Um, and I would complain, complain, complain. I think that. Uh, legislation, the things that are going on will, will help manage that. But there are good hosts. There are many, many good hosts um, on, on the platform. My, my, what I want to speak to tonight, I haven't heard it said at all, um, I have a big concern about the 104-day ban. And the, the reason, you may have guessed, um, the reason I say that is, no, I, but I'm serious about the reason, the reasoning behind it. And I really, really hope that uh, that city council considers this in your in your talks. The, this, the fear I have with the 104 day ban is there's a certain demand out there. So if, if I'm a host and I'm typically renting or I'm getting 300 days a year, let's say, on, on the platform. Well, when you, when you limit that to 104 days, what happens to those other 200 days of, of a short term rental? They're gonna go to where? Other, it's gonna spring up other short term rentals. Um, you know, so in other words, to the Gerber family, you've got, if, if someone's next to you and there's one Airbnb in your neighborhood that's leased out uh, for 300 days a year, uh, when you ban, when you, not ban, but effectively ban, what have you, if it's 104 days, the other 200 days are going somewhere else. So now there's two other Airbnbs in your neighborhood to cover the demand. If, I don't, I don't know if anybody's thought of that yet, but you're only going to have more Airbnbs by limiting to 104 days. You'd rather have less excellent hosts for 300 nights a year, for instance, than more hosts who are less interested, who are absorbing that demand. Now you've got more Airbnbs. And now you're changing the fiber of the neighborhood even more, um, if that makes sense. So that's a concern that I have um, uh, as far as maintaining the, the, the um, uh, fiber of a neighborhood, the 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 the, um, the way that the community looks, and your if your concern is more Air, you know Airbnb changing that, I think limiting the number of days is actually going to increase the uh, the need and increase the number of units. So um, I, I just don't think it's a great idea, and I think that the bad Airbnbs um, are going to be bad anyway, whether or not there's a 104 day limit or a two you know 30 day limit or what have you. So anyway. Um, Thanks for listening, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, considering our, our concerns. Thank you. The last speaker we have is Benjamin Vale. How are you doing? Uh, I'll keep it brief. I appreciate you having us tonight. Um, obviously, uh, we've had it heard from a lot of folks who the main concern seems to be the 104-day cap. Um, I believe that, that is, uh, there could be a different way to address the issues. Um, it's an unnecessarily blunt instrument that likely will worsen the overall situation without combating the underlying issues. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this proposed whole house listing ban would dr potentially drive law-abiding owners out of the market, but many who would also just go underground. Uh, while Columbus would lose out on tax revenue, um, data from other cities shows that a ban would probably even reduce the number of whole, um, a ban would probably not even reduce the number of whole house listings that are listed, as we've just heard from the gentleman there. Um, New York City is an example that enacted much harsher set of regulations 
and restrictions on short-term rentals. And it still has an increase in listings even after those regulations were uh, enacted. And despite New York City having spent millions on more aggressive proactive enforcement uh, regime, this has led to repeated clashes with homeowners and bad publicity for the city. Um, one thing that I want to point out is there are other ways to address the concerns, uh, such as the neighbors and other folks that have concerns about uh, safety and affordable housing. Um, one thing I, I haven't heard tonight, I just want to point out, uh, we as hosts, I, I, we started uh, the Columbus Hosting Alliance for the reason to get the hosts uh, information about how to be responsible hosts and how uh, you could effectively manage your listing so that it doesn't disrupt the neighbors or other people around you. Um, we have started a committee to do responsible hosting and to have guidelines for hosts to follow. Um, there is a product, uh, there's a company out there called Noise Aware, and I just want to make everyone aware of this. Is uh, it's, it's basically like a smoke detector, and we have a, this device in several of our listings that essentially will alert the guests and alert the hosts when noise in that listing has risen above a certain amount of uh, decimals for a sustained period of time. Um, and we have, uh, I can show you examples of where we have a device that has alerted us to noise in a listing, we've communicated with the guest, and that noise has dropped off. And I just, you know, so there are technology and other ways to address the concerns uh, that uh, other than the 104-day ban, which really wouldn't do uh, very much for those. Uh, a lot of the other stuff that I had to say is repetitive, and I don't want to hold anybody longer tonight, so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. It's my understanding John Massimano yeah. did have a form, but I don't know I, why I didn't. I signed the wrong, I'm sitting over waiting, but I'm not hearing my name, but I'm John Massimiani. I signed this uh, sign-in sheet, and uh, I'm sitting back here listening, and I'm working on a house in, in uh, Columbus by the Italian Club, and everybody I've talked to said, when I said I'm going to do this Airbnb, um, every, not one person's had a negative uh, feedback, but I'm sitting here listening to everybody talk, and when everybody keeps getting up here and says, this 104 ban is going to put me out of business. So I don't know if we're just up here doing lip service or what, but I think we, the city should really think about what they're doing and get more data, because it sounds like we haven't done our homework as much. Um, when we're asking where'd the 104 come from, like nobody could really answer that. Um, but this, you know, I'm doing this house, I'm putting a lot of money into it, and the people that are out in, the, in here, what they don't understand, it is harder to do Airbnb, and I haven't even got into it yet, but I know a little bit about the rental business. It's more work more work than it is if you rent it to one person, because then you never show up at that place. When you have to be around every single day or you have to have somebody there, it's better. It's better for the community. I also have business on campuses. I got three campus uh, places, but I like that it's, it's telling people about the local community. Uh, you stay in a hotel, you don't even really leave the hotel. Um, so I think there's just a lot of good reasons for it. Me and my kids and wife stayed in an Airbnb in Cayman Islands, and it was the best experience I've ever had. When I came back, that's when I started thinking about this Airbnb. But I also, you know, like I hope it's not like the city's already made their decision and we're just out here just saying what we want. But when I hear too many people say, it's going to put me out of business, I think about my grandfather. If they would have came and told him when he came here from Italy, if they would have said, you can only work 104 days, he probably wouldn't have come. This is the American dream that these people out here, I own my own businesses, I know what it's like. They get the taste of it and now we're trying to eliminate it. One person said, and this is what I was thinking about the whole time, it sounds like a money grab and that happens a lot with, this, with Columbus, it really does. Somebody starts doing something and guess what? You're so worried about it, how come you don't want to do the inspections then? No, we want to take the money, but we don't want to inspect it because that's too much work. So I didn't hear anybody talk about that. I don't think anybody has a problem with paying taxes or, or doing it right, but don't make a decision because somebody had a party in Cleveland and it was 300 people there. Everybody's scared about that, but nobody here, everybody seems, we have a couple people that had issues. There's 150 people in here. And I think a majority is for it, and I haven't even got into it, but it's making me worried because it's already trying to control. It's almost like we're, you know, 
um, trying to control what's going on here. And I think, um, I just hope they don't put that ban on. I don't need it, but a lot of people out here to do, do need the, uh, the ban doesn't make sense and nobody has said anything why it's a good idea, but sorry I messed up over here. Thank you. No problem. Just to be clear, you wouldn't support having additional safety checks before allowing someone to be a short term? Yes. Runner? Okay. No problem. Appreciate it. With that, that is our last speaker. I want to thank everyone in attendance tonight. Uh, we are uh, always expecting a very healthy debate and really appreciate everyone's opportunity to provide uh, that discussion. I want to thank CTV, particularly the Rec Center, for staying open late, my staff. We will be holding our second hearing on this legislation on Thursday, June 14th at 5.30 at the Schiller Park Recreation Center. As always, you can call my office, 614-645-8084, or email me at mstanziano at columbus.gov with any other questions. With that, this hearing is adjourned.